Good morning and happy Sabbath. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. What a privilege and a pleasure it is to have you, our viewing audience, join us today. Many of you have been joining us from week to week and you have shared how blessed you have been by the lesson study. We are so delighted that you have chosen to join us again this week for another exhilarating study of God's Word here on Logos University. And here with us again is our panel, Dr. Ashley Smith, our head elder, Elder A.C. Duane Burgess, and our newest panelist, we want to welcome Dr. Shanna Lee Birch. Dr. Birch is an avid seeker of truth and a friend of God. She is the wife of Lamel Birch, and they have two amazing daughters. Shanna Lee uses biblical truths and life experiences, both work and professionally, to cultivate her career. Dr. Birch, we want to welcome you to Logo Sabbath School. And as always, our esteemed moderator, Dr. Stanley James. We invite you to participate in our discussion by sending your questions to the telephone number appearing on your screen, 441-707-4300. You can also send your questions and prayer requests or leave us a comment 
on our live stream platform at the Hamilton SDA Church YouTube page and on our Facebook page, Hamilton King. On our Facebook page, we would like for you to like and share. Tell a friend and come and join us as we study today. So please continue to let us know where you are viewing from and how the program and lesson study has been blessing your heart. We would love to hear from you. And as always, our prayer is that the time that you spend with us will draw you to engage in a deep, in-depth, exhilarating study of the Word of God, thereby developing an intimate relationship with the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. We will now be blessed in song by Sister Simone Otterbridge. Good morning, Sabbath School. Good morning. As we are in this time and season of unrest, and it seems like we're on the battlefield, let's sing that because we need to be on the battlefield for our Lord. Amen? Amen. So, I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Stand up for Jesus. 618 in our hymn book. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Victory, I 
Amen. Our next song, 612, 612, Onward Christian Soldiers. Thank you, Sister Simone, for reminding us exactly where our battle and our fight is, and that as Christians, we must be on the battlefield for our Lord. And so our opening prayer will be brought to us this morning by Elder Duane Burgess. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you again just for the privilege of being here this morning alive well and with an open heart to receive all that you have for us. We lift up our other teachers that in the Zoom meetings and in different places, love and God, we pray that their experiences might be such that they will recognize that you have been in their presence today. We lift up our country as we find our way easing into phase three of our, of our situation with the coronavirus, love and God, and we're praying and that you'll continue to be among the midst of us that we will come out of it, loving God, praising you, recognizing that you have always been in control. And Father, as we go forward, we look through this experience and we're asking that Jesus and Jesus alone 
might be lifted up, that he might be magnified, and that his name might be praised through it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now we are ready to engage in our lesson study entitled, The Bible as History. Enjoy the lesson study, everyone. Good morning, everyone. And we're so glad that we have our participant, Dr. Shana Birch, joining our scholar, Pastor Burgess, and our tremendous participant, Dr. Ashley Smith. Now, friends, Dr. Birch said she was a little nervous. We want to make sure she feels comfortable and let her know that she's welcome. She's among family and friends. And the goal is for us all to learn together. So we want to welcome her. Logos, we start with what is that word? And it means the word in Greek. And this uh, quarter, we are studying the Bible, and not just the Bible, but how to interpret Scripture. There was a man that was um, studying recently, and he began to read about the history of the African American. And there were some conflicting stories. There was one writer who was saying that slavery wasn't that bad after all. And he began to tell how it was a business situation. And some slaves that have stories of how horrible it was, these are not necessarily true. Well, of course, many of the African-American students that were listening to him couldn't tell whether that was true or false. And of course, many of the other students supported the professor because sometimes history is uncomfortable. So archaeologists went and down into South Carolina, and they were digging there. And there they discovered teeth and bone that were sent to researchers, and it was discovered that, yes, these were Africans that came from the west coast of Africa. That changed everything in the classroom. So I ask you, does it really matter about history and the Bible, anybody, and why? I would say, yes, it, it matters. History matters because it puts, it allows us to um, put what we read into context of the Earth's history and then apply that to where we are today. So it's, it's almost like you don't know, sometimes you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've come from. Mm. Amen. Anybody else? Well, Keep that mic up, Dr. Birch. Yes, 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 yes. I know you'll penalize me for it later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming. Yes, yes, yes. Burge, I'm coming. Yes, yes. Um, history, when you think about it, it is actually, God placed us in time and space. So, you know, be, before, before the, the creation of the world, we don't know about time. The Bible doesn't tell us about time. But it does tell us that the beginning of time was when God created the heavens and the earth. And so that's the context in which God actually created us. And so history is what? The past events that have taken place in reference to time, specifically as it relates to the human race. And so it has to have some importance because God placed us there, and it is also God's vehicle for letting us know whether or not to judge or gauge whether or not his word is actually true. So if God says such and such a thing happened, or it will happen at such and such a time, history can help us prove that God's word is actually verifiable. Okay, so take us back to our story that you talked about the professor in South Carolina. Does it really matter today whether the, about the details of the history of the African Americans and what actually took place in slavery? What difference does that make today in our, how we live our lives? Anybody? Well, again, I'll go again. Yeah, well, in that specific case. Yes, of course. Um, I think it does make a difference because the question is we can look back at history and we can also ask ourselves, are we dealing with the similar things today? And what we are seeing, whether one would look at it and say, well, it's in a different context, the, the idea that the underlying uh, principle is still there. There are those who are being oppressed. History proves that that's happened, but history also tells us that it'll happen again because it continually seems to happen unless it's addressed. And so for us to have a, an idea of what the actual truth is, history has to tell us what happened, it has to tell us when it happened, so we can go back and ask ourselves at the end of it all, is this true? Mm. 
Also, I think that it's a good way to judge how far we've actually come, specifically to the African American experience um, that, that you are talking about. If we look back, we can see, okay, well, at least we're not in shackles anymore physically, um, and at least we're not uh, being beaten. Well, that's relative, but at least we're not, you know, being whipped and, and beaten and, and um, we're still being killed, but you know, we, we have, we've come to a certain degree, we've made progress, mm -hmm. but knowing history can give us that barometer mm -hmm. to tell how far we've come mm -hmm. and really how much progress have we made. Mm -hmm. And then it also provides, um, it provides explanations as to why we find ourselves in the situation mm -hmm. now. now so talking. you can say, well, I don't understand why this is why this keeps happening to African Americans, why injustices keep happening, or why I can't get this job, or why I can't do this or that, or why I feel um, I feel barred from certain experiences of life or benefits. But when you look back on history, then you can use history to explain the circumstances that we are in today. Mm. So as a physician, when I see patients. And I noticed that uh, the African-American patient when I was in the United States always had uh, worse health care outcomes. Some had strokes very early. Others died prematurely. Graveyards were filled with people who were 40s, 50s. And the, the other people, cultures, didn't die that early. Without knowing the history, I can actually conclude that they don't take care of themselves, they're neglectful, they're rebellious. Uh, I can actually blame victims for their situation yes. Yes. and not really take care in taking care of them because sometimes you distance yourself when you don't understand somebody's history, mm -hmm. application. If we look at the, our condition today, if we don't see it in light of history spiritually, we would not know how to respond and act. We're not going to understand people, how they treat us. And moreover, history also shows us in the African-American experience, reading the book Testimonies and the book Southern Work, not just what happened to the African-American, but it shows us what God was doing to deliver them and what was happening yes. with angels that were fighting in the Civil War. Oh, yes. So if history doesn't talk about us, it talks about how God was moving in the lives of people. So history, it can be about the people and what was happening to them, about God mm -hmm. and what he was doing in time. Indeed. We should never get uncomfortable because it's a touchy subject. Engage. And such is the case with the Bible. Many of us are uncomfortable studying the Bible because the cultures around have an invested interest in changing the history of the Bible. Just like there are those in that profession, in that classroom, who wants to change the history of the African-American experience. If we don't know the history of the Bible, we make up the wrong conclusions about how we're saved. Such is the case with social history. If we don't know the history of this population, how we treat them would also be different. So the key text today is which one, uh, Ashley? It is Deuteronomy, or it's found in two places actually, Deuteronomy 5, 6 and Exodus 20, verse 2, which says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Okay, now the three main parts of that. I want to start with the first part. Uh, I'll put this one on um, Elder Burgess. Ooh. The I first the part, what, what's happening in that, that construction? Uh, and that, uh, that Exodus text. What is God saying? Why is he saying it? Who is he talking to? And what's the relevance at the time when he said it? God is speaking to Israelites who had just been delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. The Egyptians, I'm sorry, the Israelites had been 400 years in slavery, or at least in Egypt, mm -hmm. and they had taken on the customs and the maxims of the Egyptians with the belief that there were many gods. Mm -hmm. God is saying, I am the Lord, your God. In other words, I am singular. There aren't other gods. In other words, you are to have no other gods other than me. So he's making it quite clear. Unlike the many gods that they have there, you only have one. Okay. So, so you put the emphasis on I am. Okay. So he's, he's establishing that nobody else, yes. no other god. Why is that important for us today? 
because there are many who go chasing after many false gods. And as much as they chase and they chase and they chase, they never really find any comfort or any solution because the truth of it is that those gods are unable to satisfy. And there's something that, you know, I've, I've come to learn recently, you can never get enough of that which you don't need. And so when you chase and you chase and you chase after that, which really you don't need anyway, you, you'll never get enough satisfaction. There'll okay. never be enough satisfaction for you. Uh, Shana, when it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, what does that have to do for our salvation? Mm -hmm. How does it relate to salvation for us? Well, when I read that text and I see that he says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, it says that, he is the one true person. I created you, number one. I'm the Lord, your God. I'm the one that created you, so I, you belong to me. And he brought you out of Egypt. Egypt was a place of bondage, of mm. slavery. So today, he's bringing us out of the bondage of this world, the bondage of slavery that we put ourselves into with sin and our sin condition. So it's the Lord saying, I'm here for you. I've brought you out of this, and I will continue to bring you through this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like that. So one emphasis uh, for Elder Burgess is he's establishing uh, who is the one, no other God, distinguishing them from a polytheistic culture where they may be calling on other gods, but he's establishing, no, no, I am the one. And remember, this was at a mountain that was trembling and there was smoke, and God was speaking to them. Uh, what does this also say about the character of God? Uh, it says that it, it means to me that God, um, as he said in the Ten Commandments, he is a jealous God. Mm -hmm. And he is saying that, you know, I don't want you to look to anyone else. Come to me. And a lot of times we even look to ourselves as our God. We look to ourselves for our deliverance. We're like, okay, I got to think of this bright idea to get to this next phase of my life or to get out of this situation. But he's saying, no, 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 no. Focus, focus, let's focus. Focus on me. I am the Lord your God. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. You didn't bring yourself out of that situation. And so he's just, he wants our attention. He wants our devotion. He wants um, our, um, our commitment to him to trust him in everything. And so he's, he's, he's a jealous God. Not in, not in a, um, he's not an envious God. He's a jealous God saying, I want, I'm, I'm claiming this for myself and I want you to be a part of my plan of salvation. I want you to recognize me as the only one to look to for help, for your help and your salvation. Mm. So it talks about uh, dependency, mm -hmm. yes. that we should depend on God. Last question, uh, when he says, um, now they're just coming out of Egypt and they're headed toward the promised land. Why was this text so important for God to establish when you're coming out of Egypt, heading toward the promised land. What is this really all about? For a person that's coming out of a difficult situation, God does a miracle. When you go through future difficult situations, don't lean on yourself. Lean on the one that did the miracle before because he's going to do the miracle in the future. Application. Those of us who are living today, knowing the history of how God led us in the past, it's going to give us what? Faith. Faith that God is going to lead us in the future. In the future. For an end time people, Seventh-day Adventists, why is this so important? Because the times in which we are living are getting more difficult. And, there, and, and from what we're told in the Bible, specifically in the prophetic passages, is that the times are going to get far more difficult than they are right now. And as the times get more difficult, we are going to have to lean on God more and more and more. And so if our experience is such that we have trusted him in the past, our faith continues to grow and, he, and recognizing that he will bring us through the most difficult of circumstances. So just like he brought us out of bondage before, mm -hmm. he will be able to bring us out of bondage again. Yeah. Okay, uh, Doc, post-COVID, COVID contacts, or something else <laughs> you're going to say? No, I was agreeing with um, the elder that um, in the light of the last day events, and we know that as Seve Adventists, the Sabbath will be... Um, one of the major things that will be fought against, um, mm -hmm. Sunday law. Um, and so as we come to the end of the, of the days of closing of life here on earth, we're going to be battered on every end mm -hmm. and every side with the Sabbath. 
and we're going to feel very maybe discouraged. And this is an encouragement for us mm -hmm. that at the end of the time, I've brought you through smaller things before, and I can bring you through this um, trial, whatever it may be at that time. He can bring us through. So it gives us encouragement to continue that he's going to still be there for us mm -hmm. um, at the end. I would say, I, I think especially now, especially with COVID, um, the pandemic, mm -hmm. I keep hearing this term, we live, we're living in unprecedented times. We're living in unprecedented mm -hmm. times, things we've never seen before. But really, if we look at history, if we read the Bible stories, mm -hmm. it's not really that unprecedented. If, if we, we, we know that there have been pandemics before or um, plagues and um, diseases that have affected large areas of the world. And we know that there's been um, persecution, spirit, um, religious persecution for God's people throughout all of history. Um, we can read that in the Bible. So it, it makes me, it gives me the comfort that whereas this is unprecedented maybe in my lifetime, this is not unprecedented in the story of the whole world. So mm. I've seen how God has delivered his people in the past. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yes, so I yes, know yes. that he's able to do the same thing now. Mm. So our faith is grounded in knowing what God has done. Mm -hmm. And if we're saved not by our works, but by our grace in yes. faith in, faith his, in his works. works then faith is important. Mm -hmm. Faith is not just an idea. Faith also has what? Action. So in the light of that, that if indeed this is all built upon, I am the Lord your God, then history of the Bible is not really history of the Jews. It's really history of who? Yes, of God. Of God. It's history of how God actually acts. Mm -hmm. The first verse in the Bible says what? In the beginning. In the beginning. God. God created and the last verse in the Bible says what? Look it up. I know you're like, oh, good now. <laughs> you want to go back? That he yeah. recreated? Because it's a book of history, and it projects to the future. The last verse in the Bible says what? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Okay, one verse before that. <laughs> uh, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. It's a historical book. In the beginning, God created, yes. Yes, indeed. crisis took place, and I'm coming back. The whole Bible is a history, not of these people, about of how God moved. So let's talk about why is it so important to do archaeology, because that's essentially what this whole chapter is about. Mm -hmm. The two professors that wrote this book, one is a historian, the other <coughs> is an archaeologist. So the archaeologist has squeezed his way into <laughs> this particular chapter to legitimize that discipline. As you know, uh, um, um, Alder Burgess, this is one of the classes in seminary that we try to skip over, yes. get under, go around. <laughs> yes. Origins True. was like, I don't know why I have to take it's this true. class. It was never made relevant. Just like many people who are studying this chapter this week, what on earth is this and why is this important? Always we have to ask, what does this have to do with our salvation? And we're going to discover that archaeology, those are terrible course, a boring course, that, you know, you just had to get through it. Yes, yes, yes. It actually had something to do with salvation. Let's see if this can aid in salvation. We're always asking that question. What does it say? What does it mean? How does it apply to my total salvation? Indeed. Okay. It had to do with what I said. Let me take that one. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. So the first, uh, first uh, lesson on Sunday, David, Solomon, and monarchy. Mm. Okay. Uh, let's talk about that. I believe that uh, our leader for that will be Aldo Burgess. Yes, indeed. <laughs> what does this have to do with identity? Identity in reference to... Well, well let, let's back up a minute. Let's back up a minute. First of all, the Bible is making it clear that, that the events that it depicts are actually historical issues. In other words, things that actually happen. This particular issue is speaking of, of the battle between David and Saul, which is a very popular battle. And yet many will... Uh, many have challenged whether or not this actually took place. While well, they've actually done the histories and, and they've actually gone and searched and found out that the very place that they said this battle took place actually does exist. Mm. And then it also answers the question, or, or should I say challenges the question, because again, one of the criticisms, you know, there, and there are various methods of it, but one of the various criticisms is historical criticism. 
It's always the case of, did it really happen? Right. And so we can imagine now, in, in, in this situation, that imagine that if David wasn't true, if the story of David wasn't true, then Jerusalem wouldn't have been there. If David did not live, then the temple wouldn't have been there that was built by his son. And if David did not live, then maybe he would not have had a Messiah, because the Bible tells us that the Messiah came through the line of David. And so as we're looking through this situation, it's just an establishment of the fact that David actually did exist as an historical person. He was a real personality who really lived, and even archaeology has gone back to find things that have verified that David has actually existed. Mm. Which again, helps to increase our faith in the Word of God, because if, if history cannot be relied upon, then how do we actually, where does our faith rest? It has to rest on truth. It has to rest on something that is verifiable. And if it's not verifiable, then we find ourselves lost and unanchored. Mm -hmm. So um, make this practical for salvation. So there's something here about David and a battle. There's a lady in her chair out there saying, okay, struggling through some of these words. Uh, and what, okay, so what? So what? There's David, Solomon, monarchy. Mm -hmm. First of all, some of those words, some people don't even understand. Yes, yes. It's the so what. So if you were to answer the so what question, where does this victory take place? What does that have to do with your soul salvation or us as an end time people? Anybody? Well, um, as I did a study about Kerbet Kaifa, I believe it's pronounced, mm -hmm. It's the Valley of Elah where the battle took place mm -hmm. between um, David and Goliath. And it, it kind of reminds me of traveling down a road and you ask for directions for some, from somebody and they tell you, um, just drive, keep driving, it's gonna be a long drive, but there's gonna be a pink house with blue shutters on the right and you're gonna make a right turn there. And this kind of reminds me or lets me know that God in his great infinite mercy knew down the road mm -hmm we as the human race would feel some sort of like maybe discouragement. We might not know where we're going. Is this really the truth? And he puts these little landmarks along the way to give us um, some encouragement and also to give us some confidence in what we have believed all along. And so this is like one of those pink houses with the blue shutters. You don't stop there. It's just to give you some guideline. You're on the right path. This is where you're going. And this is something to prove that I, you know, I have existed and what I've said all along is true. Indeed. I like that. That's very insightful. Uh, Burgess, uh, think through the implications of what it would mean for our faith if some people claim that David did not really exist. So take David out of the Bible. Uh, well, if you take David out of the Bible again, like I said earlier, you, you take Jerusalem out of the Bible, you take the temple that his son built out of the Bible, you take the Messiah out of the Bible. You take a whole lot of things out of the Bible. In other words, it undermines everything. We're going to have to rewrite the history of Israel if we do that. Mm -hmm. What else does it take out of the Bible? Uh, and I, it's just a very question to have in mind. It also takes out of the Bible how God moved. Yes. Remember, the Bible is a history not of David. It's a history of God. God. And how he moves. And how he and moves. the interactions of human beings. So yeah. this is important in establishing... Because if you look at the battle, like Dr. Birch says, that was the battle of what? Which battle took place there? Oh, the um, Valley of Elah, David yeah. and Goliath. Yeah. David and Goliath. Yes. If you look at the garrison that they're talking about, there's a great disadvantage to the children of Israel. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you begin to see, it's no way this ragtag group of people could have fought against Goliath and his army. Yes, so there's also built faith that they really had to lean on the God mm -hmm. that brought them out of Egypt, Egypt yes. is the God that's going to take them and face their battles today. Mm -hmm. And that applies to us. I don't care how big your battle is, no matter how fortified the garrison is, if God is going to lead you to it, he'll take a smooth stone in your hand and destroy your enemy. Mm -hmm. So the worse it looks against you, the better it looks for God. Mm -hmm. That builds faith. And I find that interesting, Aldo, because uh, last week you spoke about um, Jonathan and he says, who knows whether or not God will be able to deliver with few or many. Mm. And there were those who were there who were absolutely terrified. And David went out by his own 
one is earned with the power of God, and God delivered them through one person. And so in many cases, we could look at the biggest challenges that we have and recognize that the battle is not really ours. The battle is God. Even when it seems insurmountable, God is able to overcome in situations that we couldn't even possibly dream of. And that builds our faith. It does. It also gets us to respect the Bible more. Yes. Because it becomes even more a sacred text when you see God actually did this. So you can go and read the Bible, and many people, I remember when I was at one of the universities, they said, you still believe in those stories? And I felt embarrassed because the man was a doctor. I was like, yeah. I wasn't <laughs> sure whether it was scientific enough, you know, and eventually begin to undermine your faith mm -hmm. because everybody is competing for the authority to tell yes. the truth, yes. the word. That's right. We must establish our word with evidence that supports our faith. Yes. The book Steps to Christ says that God always gives sufficient evidence yes. Yes. upon which to base our faith. God is not going to remove all doubt, but there will be enough evidence. Sufficient. And history is a part of the corroborating evidence to support our faith. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Isaiah, Hezekiah, and Sennacherib. I think that we have an expert on deck today. I believe that is Dr. Smith. Smith. <laughs> um, yes, so in Monday's lesson, um, we were reading about, we were reading in Isaiah, and it was basically re uh, 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 recounting the, um, the massive campaign that Assyria had against Judah. So um, it was basically telling the story of how God delivered his people. And that points again to our memory text, which is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Mm. I'm delivering. I have delivered you. I am going to deliver you. So um, Sennacherib, who was the, um, the king of the Assyrian country, uh, basically said, okay, we're going to launch this massive strike against Judah. He was capturing and ransacking all of these cities around Jerusalem. And so he decided, okay, Jerusalem, I'm going to hit hard too. And so he, and he's a, he's a boastful person. He like, he, he likes to talk a lot of smack, you know? <laughs> so he's, he's like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, do Mercy. this and that to your, to your people and to your city. And so um, his messengers delivered his, delivered that message to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is sunk. You know, he's feeling, he's already, he's feeling almost defeated already. And he, because he knows that all of this destruction has been going on around Jerusalem already. Mm -hmm. And so he goes to God and he says, God, this is what Sennacherib has said to me. This is what he said he's going to do. I know that you are the only mm -hmm. true God. I know that you see all, you know all, you can do anything. I need you to come through for me. And one, one important thing to point out is that when you go to God yes. in prayer and supplication, when you lay out your concerns to him, that gives him the opportunity to show you what he can do. Instead of saying, he didn't go straight to his, to his, um, his generals and his, his soldiers and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to beat Sennacherib. I don't care. I know he killed everybody else, but he's not going to kill us. He went straight to God, and Hezekiah told God what was on his heart. And then God decided to, show, to come through for Hezekiah and show him his strength and show him his might. And God said um, that Sennacherib would not, he said, um, he shall not come into this city. Mm -hmm. Or shoot an arrow there, Mercy. or come before it with a shield, or mount up a, um, a siege mount against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return, and he shall not come into the city, says the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. That's, in, that's found in Isaiah 37, 33 to 35. So we, we know that, or we can use history to... Uh, prove that this this happened because recent excavations um, have shown that there was massive destruction um, in in Judah in that area 
And it even showed that in Nineveh, which was Sennacherib's palace, um, it, there were walls. He, he basically drew dis- or, um, had descriptions inscribed on his palace walls showing the destruction of all of those Judean cities. However, what's missing is Jerusalem because he never, he never destroyed Jerusalem. And so we can use those we can use those um, historical findings to prove that this actually um, happened in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And I find so, it interesting again, yeah, ahead, that even in the very beginning in chapter 36 of Isaiah, it speaks again of time and place. It speaks that in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, that Sennacherib king of Assyria came up against the fortified cities of Judah and took them. So it tells us the time, it tells us the place, it also tells us exactly where Sennacherib's ambassador came to deliver the ladder, the war ladder to him. And then what I found also interesting is the fact that we don't have in this particular scenario something that was heard from someone else. It tells us that certain people came out, so Eliakim of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shabna the scribe, and Joah the son of As- Asaph, sorry, the recorder came out. So you had the head of the household, you had the scribe, and you had the recorder. If, if, if the three of them couldn't get the story right, then something was wrong, because that was literally their job. And so literally, they, I'm sure they actually went in and actually wrote about what actually happened. We have firsthand information from people who are actually on the ground about what actually happened. If that doesn't give you faith to believe it, I don't know what does. Amen. Yes. Um, I like to pull out of this um, another a part. We do know that when the... Israelites were sleep, um, when the Assyrians rather were sleeping, that an angel of the Lord came and actually slew uh, several of the men, and that's why, how they were defeated. Israel didn't actually do anything um, Not at all. for them. The Lord worked on their behalf. And so that brings a point to me um, coming from John 16, verse 33, where he says, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy, or that, are, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is how the Lord works. He says, put the burden on me. And just like Hezekiah went ahead and put the burden, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm mm. back against the wall. And um, he, the angel of the Lord went and slew um, many of the Assyrians, and they were afraid, and they withdrew or they retreated. And so in that same way, it gives us confidence to know when we put our burdens in the Lord's hand, he will take it, and we don't Amen. have to fear. Amen. But he does not allow us to not go through it. That's part of the, that's part of the test. Mm-hmm. He made them get with their back against the wall. Sometimes he puts us in uncomfortable, uncomfortable situations so that we can lean fully on him and trust in him. Mm-hmm. Indeed. And, then, and the Bible also tells us that these stories that we see in the Bible were given as examples mm-hmm. for us that we might be able to trust as time went on, that God does deliver his very people. And I'm glad, you know, both of them have alluded to it, but the very first thing, and, and, and here's what I want to draw, that in many times we try to sort out our situations first, like Ashley was saying, instead of going to God first. Think about it now. Sennacherib had a huge army, huge army, and the first thing that King Hezekiah did was go to God, and it was over in a day. Didn't have to raise a sword, didn't have to go out, didn't have to do anything. They were completely decimated. 85,000 of them were completely decimated in one night, and Sennacherib went home and was killed. Mm. How much more can God do for us if we decided to stand out of the way and just place it in God's hands? Amen. And I think that um, it's important to remember that Egypt... So going back to the memory text, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Egypt can represent different things in our lives. So Egypt can be um, a spiritual bondage. Egypt can be something financial. Mm -hmm. Egypt can be um, a mental issue or or family issue that you're having, something physical. Egypt can represent so many things. Mm -hmm. But as long as we are looking to God as our source of strength and God as our help, then we are able to get through that battle. Mm. So you're telling us, Ashley, that God is still bringing us out of Egypt. Oh, yes. Th- th- that's what you're telling us. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to. So for those who didn't quite understand Monday, you have two different stories, histories being taught about the same battle. Yes, indeed. 
So what Monday was saying is that they looked through this guy's uh, uh, Sennacherib's uh, library. And in the king's back, they always write stories about their victories. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So he sent his guys out to write this story about the victory. He said, I saw all of Hezekiah's cities, 48 of them. And we came and rained down terror. He was bragging. Yes. And we made it through, and we made it all the way up to Lachish. And he stops there. And all he simply says is that then he turned back. But the Bible comes and tells the same story. And it says that they saw Hezekiah coming, and the men of God decided to pray. Now, not everybody was protected. Not everybody was covered, but those who were in Jerusalem. And I like what Jesus says. Jesus says this, and he shall come into the city, and, and he shall not shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege against it. Watch what Jesus says. Mm -hmm. But by the way he came, this is way he by the same he <laughs> shall return. <laughs> and now the God says, I'm going to send that boy back <laughs> about his business. Yes, indeed. That there are some places that you just cannot go. That there are some places that are fortified by God. Mm -hmm. Not everybody in the church is necessarily fortified, mm -hmm. but when a man lays down and says, I can do no other. I can help myself. God says, it's only so far you can go. Indeed. I don't know who your Hezekiah is. I don't know who your Assyrian is. But if you trust in the Lord your God, he's going to send them back the same way they came. And I don't care how they write the story. You need to read the story from your experience. It was God and God alone. Indeed. Again, the story of the Bible is the history of how God moves, not how we move. Yes. Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, and Babylon. How did they help to build our faith? I think this is... Uh, Dr. Birch. <laughs> well, um, Daniel um, is a wonderful story. Um, it starts off with um, an Israelite who is taken from his native land, and he is a young boy, so he's impressionable. But even though he went into a native land where he was the immigrant, so he was different. He wasn't the same. And it would have been so easy to assimilate to the culture, to follow the crowd, to just try and fit in. Make that applicable to your daughter if she was listening today. What are we saying to her? We're saying that when you go out in your social settings and... You go to school. You go to school. When you go to school, when you go back after Zoom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you go back to school, um, there's going to be the popular crowd. And the popular yes. crowd... Um, a lot of the time may not be doing the right thing. They may be cursing. They may be watching something on YouTube that's not really um, something that you would want them to watch, something God wouldn't want them to watch. It's okay to stand up and say, you know what? Um, I don't want to be part of this. This is not something, you know, it's okay to stand up on the side of God and walk away. It's okay not to get involved with all of the popular trends because um, in, in, in this particular story with Daniel and with them, um, God will glorify you. When you stand up for him, he will give you a blessing that you would never think was coming your way. And the habits that you form in the youth, they, um, they became the pattern that will strengthen your life as you go through. Um, so I had also made a note that even for myself, when I was in dental school, um, when I first got there, you don't know anybody, everyone's new, and it, you know, it comes to that Friday night where you have a study group, everyone's studying together, and they say, okay, let's get together you know, Friday night, and you have to walk away. And they wonder, what are you doing? It's, you know, we have this huge exam, and then they're studying all day Saturday, and you're home like, Lord, I know you've got this for me, but you still feel a little nervous. Ashley, I know you know what I'm talking about. And, <laughs> oh, um, yes. Everyone's into that. <laughs> and so when you, um, when you get the grades back, you are even, like, surprised. You've gotten as good or better than they did. And there's no strength of your own. It's the Lord who comes in and says, you know, I'm going to honor you because you honored me and you Amen. were faithful to me. Amen. So mm. I think that Matthew 6.33 is it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added. And that's what Daniel did in this particular story. Anybody else want to share on that? 
No, I, I, I can share the, um, that experience as well. Uh, when I was, I would study, I've, I've never, I've always purposed in my heart to keep the Sabbath even over anything that I value or treasure, which is school. I'm, I'm probably a, I, I love school and I would love to study and learn, but I drew the line when it came to the Sabbath. And I always did that. And I remember in pharmacy school when um, there was a girl um, who was, I think she was one or two years ahead of me. And she, we were having Sabbath dinner at someone's house. And, and she said, OK, well, I've got to go. I've got an exam. And then um, and I was like, you don't have to. And she says, you know, no. She says, I don't know about you, but I can't, I can't afford to spend 24 hours not studying. And I said, oh, OK. But you know, it really is a testament to what God can do when you, put, when you place it in his hands and you, do, you follow what he says based on principle, then he can show you what he can do. Now, this particular day highlights um, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon as a symbol of what animal? The lion. The lion. And of course, we see in Daniel chapter 7, we talk about a, a, a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Mm -hmm. So we see the lion was actually in Daniel chapter 7 as a symbol of Babylon. And do you know, researchers, archaeologists actually went and discovered in the deep dirt something that will blow your mind. They found a city right there in the same area with these big animals that were lions. On the walls, yeah. What else this shows is that Daniel was an oppressed man in a very strong city. Yes. It had double walls. It's an impenetrable city. It's walls that actually were laid in gold. And every block had actually the name Nebuchadnezzar yeah, stamped, stamped on it. Yeah, that's Why is this so important? Because when the Bible says he purposed in his heart, this is one man a slave who actually became a eunuch, yes. saying in his mind, do to me whatever you will, I'm going to serve my God. So the more and more evidence that we see in, 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 in archaeology that, yes, it existed. The Bible talks about a lion symbol. It talks about an oppressive power. The Bible's saying, but in the midst of that oppressive power that archaeologists are showing, let's see what God was doing. How does that apply to us today? Oppressed people are very frightened. Mm -hmm. You can imagine this guy, Neb Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar, the father and the son, pulled these people to walk miles, miles, miles as slaves in chains across the desert in the Middle East. They finally get there, and they're frightened. And when they get there, the easiest thing to do is try to stay alive. And all of a sudden, there's one guy and two friends, three friends, that says, you know, no matter what, we're going to stick true to principle. People tend to bite up on each other and compromise and sell out because of the fear of power. And I can see, I know when I was young, I, it, it was hard to say I'm going to stick with Adventism when everyone else was going on Sabbath to football games, uh, um, doing things that against our values. It's hard to stand alone. But the text says he purposed in his own heart. No matter how big your peer pressure is, no matter how big your oppressive power is, if you're going to keep sane and safe and survive, you got to stand on something solid. And guess what? The Bible and history talks about Daniel as a victor, yes. but Nebuchadnezzar as a loser. More than that, it is a story of the history of God moving, but God moves with people who choose to move with him. Yes, yes, that, that's the point. I'm so while saying. history is being told about God doing stuff, you can either be one that's doing it with him or just a side note, cliff note, comma, or period that nobody recognizes. You can see how I'm, I'm always amazed, again, through history, how when a person submits to the will of God or whatever, that they can become very bold. As we look at the story in Daniel chapter 5, Daniel is, is, is explaining to Belshazzar, um, Nebuchadnezzar's son, about the fact that he knew about all the things that happened to Nebuchadnezzar. 
And so when, when he said that he would be third, Belshazzar told Daniel, listen, if you can interpret this, I'll make you third in the kingdom. And Daniel said, you can keep your gifts. I, I don't need any of your gifts. He says, but the Lord actually showed your father that he was God. He went through all of his episodes. This is Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, and you knew all of this, he told him, and yet you failed to respond. And because of that, God now has ripped away your kingdom, and it's over. And it, can you imagine Daniel standing there now, and Daniel is telling this man at the end of it all that God has just taken away your kingdom. How many kings at that point in time would have accepted that? Because Nebuchadnezzar, we knew, didn't want to accept that until he was humbled. This son now, who recognized, who's heard the story, still refuses. It, it, it's almost unbelievable that he did it, but that's just sometimes how it is. How many others are hearing of the stories even that have happened in their own families? Mm -hmm. How God has brought some of their own people to the recognition that they are God and they have submitted, and yet they choose to go out and run out and do everything that they choose to do. So Daniel, uh, and I'm going to come to Ashley next, uh, Daniel is an oppressed man. Yes. And he actually has become a eunuch where, he, against his will, yeah, of his testicles were taken off. Mm -hmm. they, but despite all of that, somehow he keeps a positive mind. And he says, I'm going to purpose in my heart mm -hmm. to serve God. Right? So we have to cooperate with God as God is writing history. But someone has sent a question and says, okay, if indeed this is all true, why then, if God is working with us, why is there so much segregation in the church, even to the point where we have a black and white conference? And let me push pause. Many people are uncomfortable engaging in the discussion of, of a history of race. We can talk about the Catholics really bad. We can talk about the Jewish Holocaust of great interest. We could talk about the American Indian and say, wow, that's really sad. But as soon as you get onto this discussion of segregation and race and history, we become uncomfortable. But the question has come, and we have to deal with it. And we must confront our discomfort yes. and even ask, why am I uncomfortable? If this is the history of how God is moving with people in history. But we can talk about Catholics. But we can't talk about this construct. I think we should be bold enough in Logos University to ask the question, how is it that God is moving with delivering people from bondage that the Seventh-day Adventist Church still grapples and wrestles with the issue of racism? I, I was actually thinking about this earlier in the lesson. Um, in order to understand that, we need to go back to history. history. <laughs> yeah. you, once you look at history, you look at race relations, you look at what our people have gone through, and I'm saying um, our people, blacks and whites, ma majorities and, and minorities, majority and minorities. If you look at history, then you can understand possibly why there are two different conferences. Why sometimes for cultural reasons, for historical reasons, that well, I know that's why we that's why we were um, that's why our conference or the second conference was created because of the issues of the day. And so because mm -hmm. people of that time were not able to accept others um, as equals, and because people were, there was, such, there was such oppression still, we needed to create a conference in which African Americans or minorities could worship freely and, and have a space, have a place to, to be able to you know, identify, still identify with the church, but be able to identify with our, our other concerns and our, our social issues. So it's because of the social issues that, that we had to create those two separate conferences. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, those social issues have not been resolved. No. And no. This, is, this is one of the reasons, I think, why we still have the two conferences and why we, there still is what some people would consider a divide or a split. Mm -hmm. But I um, personally, I don't. I I still see the need, definitely for change and for progress, but also the need for the two separate conferences. Mm hmm. Elder Burge, uh, you're up to bet. Well, I, I um, don't pause. I, I won't. Don't I won't. hesitate. I won't. Hold I that mic closer. I believe. I, I believe. Said I can't that hear you. Yeah, I, I, you hear me clearly. <laughs> Within our church, there's still the weed and the tears. 
And that doesn't necessarily go necessarily always to race relationships, but the fact that not everyone's converted. Let's be honest about that. Also, there's the logistical um, issues that come with re-amalgamating everything and pulling everything back together. Well, if that's the case, who's going to be in charge? Who's going to run this? Who's going to do that? What, what, what about the, the, the uh, insurance and, and, and pension programs that they have for people? There's a lot of logistics that go into this particular situation. It's easier to split in that situation than it is to come back together. Seemingly, it's strange because it seems like it, when it comes to marriage, it's easier to get into marriage than it is to get out. But when it comes to this situation, it seems easier to be in it than to get out. It's, 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 it's very complex. And again, many will look at it and see it just as, well, we should do what we do. Not, re not necessarily understanding what it takes for that to actually happen. How much will, uh, what will it take to make that happen? Will it take away ultimately from what it is that we're actually trying to do? How many man hours will be taken away when we should be witnessing to the world, and particularly in the last days, should we be fussing and fighting about this? Well, I don't know about fussing and fighting. I do think something should be done about it. What does yes. history have to say to help inform us with this issue? History tells us that historically it, it doesn't get sorted out. It doesn't get sorted out. It goes on and it goes on and it goes on. And so based on it, I mean, I, I'm not saying at the end of it that we should give up hope. But history has shown us thus far that people are unwilling to let go of power, to let we go let, of leadership. Now, I'm going to push you. I'm going to push you. Yes. So we still have regional conferences and state conferences yes. in the United States. Yes, we do. South Africa still has, I've been there, yes. uh, conferences so that are largely white yes. and largely black. Yes. If you go to even Europe, the churches are divided, and it, it looks like it's not. But ultimately, there are still strongholds that are divided by race. Yes. You go to Australia, while well, you know, the Aborigines, yes. there are issues. So if we look closely under the, the maroon blanket of Adventism mm. and look at the black and white, we still see distinctions. And it's a legitimate question, whether it be from an Adventist or other, yes. why are you still divided corporately if you're Christians collectively? Mm. Anybody, let's hear that question addressed. The worship experience is um, largely cultural as well. And so I think that cultural differences also lend to possibly a need for uh, uh, different conferences uh, that can cater more to, to certain groups of people from a cultural perspective, from a historical perspective of their people or of, of, of how they uh, worship, how they emote. Mm. So that's one one dimension that I look like at. Like different worship styles? Yes. yes. It does okay. a lot too. Does Anyone else? Um, how does it land on you, uh, Dr. Birch, the fact that someone will raise that question? I mean, how does it feel? How does it land on you? What would you tell your children if they ask that question? Well, I was going to actually say what Ashley said, and I, at, at the worship styles, but also people are comfortable with who yes. they are comfortable yes. with. Yes. Um, if you go into a place, if I go to a place, well, I went to school um, in Canada in, in a predominantly white area, and I was the only white, uh, only black person in my neighborhood. Stay with me, stay with me. Yeah. So being um, by myself, I always felt a little different than everyone else. And then when I um, went to larger school and I went to Howard University, it was like coming home because I was around people that looked like me, had the same goals as me. So worshiping with like believers, not, not just in mind, but also who look like you, it also gives comfort to people. Not that it's right, but that's, we feel comfortable with our own. And so that's something that happens. Now, and I never really understood what Elder Burgess was saying until just now about how to change it would be difficult because there's money involved in how they allocate pensions and allocate different things in the different conferences. So that's something I never took into account because I always used to be saying they should just change it and just make it all one conference. But there's things that have been invested into these conferences. So it's not just an easy, um, just let's change it next year or whatnot. So for my children, I would say we must love every culture as our own you may feel more comfortable with your culture. You may, may feel more comfortable with someone outside of your culture. But people are people on either end. So you have to treat all the same way. I like that. That's a wonderful response. Uh, so this is indeed a very delicate subject, very. which can actually very. take up quite a bit of time. I do think it's worth responding. I think you've ended up spoken to it well. One actually spoke of the history. Mm -hmm. 
Adventism is a part of the fabric of humanity. Mm -hmm. Every culture that it is in, it takes on some of the issues of the fallen nature yes. of that yes. culture. And we're ever progressing, hopefully, to the gospel to change our hearts so we become a part of the culture of Christ. Now, that requires faith and obedience. Yes. It doesn't just require attitude. It also requires action. And history shows us that through, and you look at our history through the testimonies, we see Jesus moving through the Civil War, trying to bring about justice. I don't think there's another writer other than Alan White that talks about Jesus and angels in the battle for freedom for black people. So throughout the whole Civil Rights War, the battle, the North going down and the South coming up, and the spirit of prophecy says there are times when angels that excel in strength had to hold back the oppressive forces and give a breakthrough. Yes, what does that mean for us today and regional conferences? Well, we know in the 1950s there was a major crisis. In the United States, in Washington, D.C., there was a lady, Ms. Bird, who went to the hospital, Washington Adventist yes. University Hospital. When she got there, because she was black, she was rejected. Yes. She was then sent down to Howard, now Howard University Hospital, where she was cared for. This caused a great problem on the black preachers. Black preachers were baptizing people all across North America. First in evangelism, but last in Adventism. Yes. And so they held a meeting, and the leadership decided, you need your own conferences. Now, they said, we use some expedient language so that evangelism can grow better in your field. It's better if you organize yes. together as a group of people yes. and do your own evangelism. But the root issue, the substratum, was that when you go to the general conference headquarters, you still, as a black person, have to sit in the black part mm -hmm. in the cafeteria, mm -hmm. and the white people sit in the white part. That's not figment. That's why history That's is history. so important. Yes. Because we've got to know this uncomfortable stuff to see how God has led us from the past and what we must do to keep going toward the future. Now you may say, well, that was in the past. Well, Andrews University didn't allow black students to attend until the world changed, then we changed. Our white churches in South Africa didn't allow black people to participate actively. Until the world changed, then we changed. I think what history can tell us is that we need to start making decisions yes, yes. to change and show the Christian culture, and maybe the world would change, because we are the salt of the earth, and it's our duty to change people into the likeness of Christ. Mm -hmm. So structural conferences... That is going to be because the human condition exists. But if we can actually build a character of Christ and spend time changing the community's hearts, we wouldn't even notice these conference differences. We will move back and forth across the boundaries. Now, there are those, uh, Dr. Rock, a friend of mine, who wrote that group adhesion is a natural phenomenon. Like uh, Dr. Burt says, people get together where they are comfortable. So there's nothing wrong with that. And business corporate structures are relevant for evangelism. It's easier to deal with a minority group or a black group and leadership in that community to do it. We shouldn't change for cosmetic purposes, just so it doesn't look bad. If it's changed, let it be because it's, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But let us change hearts, not structures first. Let's move on to Wednesday. The historical Jesus. Talk to me about that. I believe that's Dr. That's me. Yes, Alda that's Burgess. Me. Yes. In this particular instance, we're talking about the idea that Jesus is actually an historical figure. And there are those around. So in other words, they, they have no necessarily um, evidence of other than, than that which is reported of Jesus himself. And so they look around, they're looking for those that are around Jesus. Because there are no bones for Jesus to be found. He, he's not here. And so they found bones of Caiaphas, who was the high priest at that time. They seen inscriptions about Pilate, who was the governor of Judea at that time, the same time. They've also seen many records that speak about the worship of Jesus himself. And it's interesting because, because the one that all the fuss is actually made about, the only evidence we have is that which people have said. And so even when you look at, and, and, and I'm interested, it's interesting that it wasn't mentioned in this particular scenario, in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 1, it says, More of a brethren, I declare to you, this is Paul speaking, right into the Corinthian church, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you also are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, 
that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He's giving, he's giving historical evidence backed up by scripture. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part, of whom, sorry, the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James and by all the apostles, and then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Paul is making it clear that, listen, Jesus is not a figment of our imagination. He was seen by many people after he was on the cross, after he died, after he was risen again and resurrected, he was seen by many people. This is no hoax. This is not fake news. There are too many witnesses around here, and there are some who were still living at the time, and Paul wrote it to be able to testify to it. And so even though archaeology itself has the idea that uh, or it can possibly support, we have to be careful as well because archaeologists also use it sometimes to refute. And so again, when it comes to that, we need to recognize that our trust must be in the inevitable word of God. It is the word of God that our faith is based upon, the facts that the word of God actually puts out to us. So even when we have those who argue against what the Bible has to say, we can say we will stand on the word of God. Uh, Dr. Birch, was there anything that illuminated, jumped out at you, Holy Spirit, but when you when you read that part? Um, for this particular lesson, the only thing that I really took from it was that the evidence, seeing Caiaphas um, remains and also seeing this signet of Pontius Pilate, is just evidence there, extra evidence that is the archaeologists are finding now that helps to bolster or reaffirm our faith in, mm -hmm. um, in God yeah. because all of these characters did exist. And so now it's just another landmark saying, okay, this is what we knew already because I had faith in God. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Smith? Um, I, I would say the same thing. It just um, solidifies what we, re it, it, I would say it just provides more evidence for what we have in the Bible. So we have enough evidence in the Bible, but there's, there is opportunity for us to say, okay, well, we found archaeological or historical evidence as well to support our biblical evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now notice that the first day, it says the Bible goes on assuming that yeah. God exists. Yes, that's right. That's it, right. It, it works with that fundamental presupposition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God exists, and then it brings it. Now, this is what God did with the Egyptians. This is what God did with the, with the Israelites. This is what God did with the Canaanites. It's always an action with the understanding that God actually exists. Now, if we come at that understanding, this material that we're studying about a historical Jesus, how does... I mean, how does this help us with understanding that God does exist? Does this prove anything, or does this support things? Anybody? Supports it. Supports it, right? Because many people who come to talk about the Bible are skeptics. Mm -hmm. If you were trying to take history and the Bible to convince a skeptic, I don't, I, I'm not sure how effective that would be. Because there are enough reasons for people who don't want to believe it not to believe, not to believe. it. But if the Holy Spirit has moved on somebody and they believe in the Word of God and they need evidence to support that for themselves yes. and those who are fellow believers, this evidence helps to establish, yes, indeed, there was a historical Jesus, yes, that he existed, he lived, people saw him, they knew him, they touched him, he was temporal, he was real, he was not what you call a timeless God that doesn't come into time and space, who walks with men. He wasn't somebody that just magic and changes things. No, he was a literal Jesus who walked and touched with people. That, that, that's wonderful. It, it, to me, I think that makes things personal. Faith and history. Now, this is, I think, uh, Dr. Birch's um, area of expertise. What <laughs> lessons can we learn from these ancient heroes by studying their lives? Uh, Dr. Smith, forgive me. <laughs> I'm putting a lot of weight on you, Dr. Birch. I'm so excited that you're here. I was ready for you, though. I was ready for you. <laughs> She's, I was ready for you. Um, it, this actually, uh, Wednesday leads in quite well to Thursday's lesson. Because the end of Wednesday's lesson, it says, though it's always nice to have archaeological evidence that supports our faith, why must we... Why must we learn not to make our faith depend on these things as helpful as they, be at time, they may be at times? The thing is that 
though we do have, we, we can have archaeological and historical um, evidence to support what we, are, what we are believing in the Bible and what we believe God says, it's, it is important to not rely on those things because we will never have, in, you know, all of, the, all of the physical evidence to support everything in the Bible. And so at some point, you're going to just have to lean on your, your faith and your belief in, in God and in, and in what God says. So, um, and then it goes on into Thursday's lesson. We don't live in vacuums. Our choices influence not just ourselves, but others as well. And these, um, these heroes of faith that are recorded in Hebrews chapter 11 did not have all that archaeological no, evidence. They no. didn't have the scholars to say, well, we, we, um, we can verify what you say God said to you because of this and that. You know, no, they actually just had to base their actions on faith, and that's it. And what does Hebrews 11 say that faith is? It defines faith as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So they, they actually just had to act on God's word and nothing else. Okay, so each of these people here, I'm going to go to each of you and ask you what one thing does, and you don't know which one I'm going to pick, this popcorn. Okay, Elder Burgess, Enoch, what one thing does he tell you about uh, faith? What, what can you get from studying his life? Enoch's life in reference to faith was such that Enoch was so close to God that God actually took him away. I mean, I don't know how much closer you get than that. I don't know how much you believe God more than that to the point where God says, listen, Enoch, I mean, we're, we're, uh, you're perfected in your belief in me. Just, just, just come up here. There's nothing else I can do with you. I mean, just, just come up here and hang out with me. I mean, that is the ultimate, ultimate um, response to faith in God because that's what God ultimately wants for us anyway. Dr. Birch, what do we get some lesson from Noah? There's not a right or wrong it's just, when I mean, you think of Noah, what from his life builds faith? Well, Noah was one that had never seen rain. So to be told you're going to build this boat, wow. what do we need a boat for? Um, maybe, yeah, so for him to have to build a boat, this huge boat, and to be told that the animals were going to come on, and he just had to build it in faith. And um, look where it ended up, saving the human race. So How does that apply to us today? Sometimes you just got to step out and do something that you don't think is going to make, that doesn't make sense in your own mind. Um, God's ways are different than our ways. They're higher than our ways. We can't, we can't fathom it. We can't explain it. But we have to step out and sometimes do something that may seem absolutely ridiculous. But God, if he's leading you, will bring you on the other side. Amen. Uh, Ashley Smith, Abraham. What lesson do we learn from that? And make a practical application to today, a pharmacist in 2020, post-COVID, can she apply from, from Abraham's life? It's very loaded. <laughs> um, uh, I would say two things about Abraham that, that stuck out. Um, number one, he left Ur to go into the wilderness because God told him to do that. He, he left Ur, which was, I think, in, in Mesopotamia, correct? Am I correct? Yeah. Yes. And so that area was the center of the world at that time. He left all the posh surroundings of the time and went into the wilderness to dwell in tents. Does that make sense to anybody? You know? Um, and, but he, he did that because God called him to do that. He, he left his sophisticated um, surroundings and went into the wilderness and, you know, with all it brings, all the, all the um, animals, the danger, the unknown, um, seeking uh, for, uh, for, the, for the promised land that God was going to give him. Also, he gave up his son, Isaac, or he was willing to mm -hmm. give up his son, Isaac, because God asked him to do that. Mm. So these two things, I think, are, are just mind-boggling when you, when you think about it, because... You know, uh, Dr. Birch, would, I, I don't think that you would ever want to be in that position to put one of your children on an altar because yeah. you <laughs> heard God tell you that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's almost, that's just unfathomable. But he had that level of faith to do that. Um, I remember um, I, was, I was actually a student at, 
at an Ivy League institution, and I decided to change my major. Long story, but um, I wanted to, I ended up going to Oakwood for one semester, and I decided to change my major. And, um, but my major wasn't offered, I didn't know that at the time when I made the decision, but my, my major wasn't offered at the Ivy League institution, mm -hmm. at which I had a full scholarship, and, and then I had to make the choice to return, either return to the Ivy League institution or, or go to Oakwood. And, you know, I was telling friends and family about it. Some of my friends were like, Oak, what? What is that? You know, and um, where is that? It's where? Alabama. You know, those types of things. And people, and I ultimately I made the decision to go to Oakwood, um, mainly because I, I didn't really know exactly what to do, but I knew that I couldn't go wrong if I went to um, what I viewed as, as God's, God's institution where I, I knew I would learn um, not just, uh, I, I was studying accounting at the time, not just accounting, but be amongst like-minded believers, learn other, um, just, just learn, be able to grow in my faith. And so I, d I made the decision on based on that principle. And almost everyone in my corner told me that I was crazy. Oh, yeah, they'll tell you that. So, and and I, I didn't even know if I was making the right choice. But the thing is, if you... If you just follow God, make your decisions by principle, um, then you can never go wrong because God will still put you in the places where you need to be and where yes. he intends you to go. Yes. Amen. Okay, so we're moving on to Friday. All the, all the rest of them, every one of them came from a place uh, of having to step out on faith with no evidence in front of them, right? And God somehow still becomes the God that leads you from a dark place to a bright place, but it's complete dependence on God. Uh, we want to wind up with Friday. Um, explain how this all relates to our personal history. Mm -hmm. Because we may not have all the evidence or the research or the archaeology. We don't. And there's somebody sitting out there saying, I, I, I don't, I'm not reading Friedman's, uh, Sigmund Freud's book or Sigmund Horn's book. What about my story? How does that give me strength? Mm -hmm. Dr. Birch? So the history of, um, we've learned about Sennacherib and how he had everything up in his, his mansion, seeing what he defeated. Um, we see Daniel with the lions on the, on the gates coming through. All of this just helps to bolster and give us confidence in what we already know. But we have to remember that even though we see these archaeological digs and these finds <laughs> and they're talking about it in the news and whatnot, we have to remember there's a, a part of it is faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. According to Hebrews 11, verse 6, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So the take home is for us in this day, yes, we can see all of the new findings that come out, but we must, number one, foremost, have faith in God. And then he will bring out what we need to know at the due time and we can live our lives according to that. Amen. We have no fear for the future, lest we forget how God has led us in the past. And faith, that is the only thing that we need for salvation that results in obedience, faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. You've got to see how God moved in the past, if he's going to move in your life, and you have faith for the future. Thank you very much. Alder Birch, would you pray for us? Father, thank you so much for, again for the experience of learning more about your word. We pray, Father, that those who have listening and those who are listening, sorry, in our viewing audiences have found their way closer to you today. Maybe they've learned something new about you. Maybe they've come to realize that the stories that they've heard about you are not necessarily true, loving God, and that you're even better than they heard. Well, Father, we're asking that your spirit will continue to move on their hearts and that as they see you more, they might draw closer to you. That at the end of it all, they might cry, loving God, if they haven't already. What must I do to be saved? This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's Amen. tell our new member how good of a job she did. It is a great uh, you job. did a wonderful great job, job, Dr. Great Bush. job. Thank you very much. We're so much looking forward to you next week. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Hard. If you believe in something
something with all your heart, it shall come to pass. I see miracles, I see miracles, I see miracles happening for you. Something with all your heart, it shall come to pass. I see miracles, I see miracles, I see miracles happening for you. I see miracles, I see miracles, I see miracles.
mind if I testify and tell you of the goodness of my Lord share some of what he's done for me how he's opened up so many doors you may look at me from the outside and think I got here on my own there's no way that you could ever know how much grace and mercy I've been shown. Oh, if you look into my eyes, you see, life has tried to get the best of me. But I know the giver of life personally. He's the reason that I sing his name is Jesus. I know this cause he died for me and he rescued me there's no greater love in the world his name is Jesus yes he loves me and I know this cause he said it to me when he rescued me there's no greater love in the world Oh, 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 there's so many things I want to tell you of how we made a way for me. If you hadn't loved me through the mistakes that I made, I just don't know where I would be. Oh, oh, oh. you show me so much favor.
lost it all. But now I see how you were there for me. And I can say, never would have made it. Never could have made it without you. I would have lost it all. But now I see how you were there for me. And I can say I'm stronger. I'm wiser. I'm better. Much better. When I look back over all you brought me through, I can see that you were the one. But God, who was rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Jesus. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having this everlasting gospel to preach to all those who dwell on the world, 
to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear this God and give glory to him for that gospel, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of the earth that are within. Welcome to the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church. God bless you. pray. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for another blessed Sabbath day. God, we're here in June already. Seems like the first half of this year has just been a complete blur. But what we do know is that you have seen everything and that you have everything under control. And so while the earth and while the world uh, is in turmoil today. We're thankful for a God in heaven who can be so peaceful that he can sleep in the midst of storms. Keep us as we worship you today. Fill us with your presence. Transform us from within. And may everyone that's listening and watching receive today a refreshing from the Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for 2020. What looks like a dark spot is a bright spot. This is a time when the planet was brought to its knees. Strong men found out that they were weak. And healthy nations 
found out that they were sick. Leaders became followers. And on the streets, followers have become leaders. At a time of peace, there became a time of war. And then when many shouted in place because of the social conditions, many sprinted through phase one, phase two, and phase three. But all this, Lord, is pestilence and war. We know we're at the end of time. And because of 2020, we can see clearly now things that we didn't see before that we need to get ready for a soon returning Savior. That the doctors cannot fix us. And the lawyers cannot release us. That we can't trust anybody. Before the hearts of man is deceptively weak, wicked. But there is somebody that we can trust. And his name is Jesus. There is a doctor that moves in the sick room. That can heal the sinful heart of men. And there's a lawyer that stands in the courtroom, an advocate before the Father for all of us who are guilty of sin. Lord, let them know that we are your disciples. Let that change come so that we can love one another. That black man can reach hands across and, me, and white man can reach arms across and we can build this bright new future, a brotherhood of humanity galvanized around the cross. And what the flesh could not do before it was weak, the spirit can do because you are strong. Bind us together around the cross, heal our sin sick hearts, and today let that beginning start with me, with us in this church. We ask that the Holy Spirit come to every home that's listening. Move on the hearts of men, not just the heads. Put our arms around those children who are tormented and frightened. Bless the pastor with the word in due season. Thank you for what you have done already. We're going to claim a success and our victory. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak to us, Father. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, speak, Lord. Okay, so we're going to open with a well-known hymn. It's a highway to heaven. None can go up there but the pure in heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. Walking up the king's highway. Oh, 
Good morning, church family. Good morning to all of you. Uh, it is good to be here in the house of the living God. We wish to welcome you to the Hamilton Seventh Day Adventist Church, where worship is a joy and the love is real. It is our petition that the grace of God, the goodness of God, and the gift of His Son, Jesus the Christ, will, not would, but will take hold of your heart, arrest your attention, and effectuate your salvation on this holy and blessed Sabbath day. I hope that as the song was sung today, you purposed in your heart to make heaven your home. The song said, it's a high way to heaven. None can go up there but the pure in heart. It's a high way to heaven, and I'm walking where, church? up the king's highway if you're not walking start while i'm talking up walking up the king's highway there's joy in knowing where what with him i am going up walking up the king's highway oh we've come here to praise god to bless his holy name and we are glad we want to welcome all of you that are watching from all over the world on all six of the seven continents that is possible. Uh, we want to thank all of you uh, that are watching through live stream, the many of you that watch on YouTube, uh, the even more so that watch on Facebook now. You can find us on Facebook at Hamilton King. Uh, you can find us also, for those of you that are in Bermuda, you can also find us on the radio on 105 Inspire FM today. 
uh, pretty soon. They are, we are working on possibly going on Instagram as well. And so just stay tuned. Uh, we want to get the gospel to you any way it is possible. Amen? And we are praising God for that. We're glad you've joined our service today. I have some announcements that I need to share with you, uh, especially in light of our government's recent decision making. First of all, before we get into that, we wish to recognize again, uh, we did this once before, we want to recognize again uh, uh, Sister Chevelle Dylan Burgess. Sister Chevelle Dylan Burgess. As you know, we've had a walk where we went to try and search uh, to find her. I think this past week was a candlelight vigil. And as some of you may know, but for the few who don't, uh, she is the granddaughter of Sister Wong, a very faithful member of this community of faith, along with her son, uh, Desric, uh, and his wife, Joy. Again, it's difficult because you don't want to speak ahead or you don't want to speak behind either. But as of right now, the signs are not looking good. Uh, they are not looking or what we would have hoped the outcome would be. It seems like the reports are leading in a more tragic direction, and we don't know exactly what the end of all of this will be, except that we know that there's coming a day when Jesus will come in the clouds of glory and make everything right. One thing we're certain is that Jesus knows exactly what happened, when it happened, and how it happened. And so, we just want to extend our love to Sister Wong, to Desric, to Joy, to their immediate family as they deal with this crisis of unknowing, of difficult, of sorrowful reports. We want you to know that we here at the Hamilton Church love you dearly and our prayers are with you continuously. Secondly, we wish to extend again our condolences and give an update in regards to the funeral of Sister Barbara Romaine. Uh, that funeral will take place here in the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church tomorrow at 2 p.m. As you know, the government has limited us to only 10 persons in the building. And so the family has had to invite uh, those specific guests uh, to be present uh, and we're going to make sure that they are taken care of and accommodated in this place. Even though we can have the full service that many would like to have for Sister Rebane, a very beloved member of this community of faith, we are still going to give them first class service in this house. I want to say that one of the things that has been added is that at 1 p.m., the hour before, there will be a viewing here at the church. Again, we will have to make sure that only 10 persons are in the building and that social distancing is practiced. There will be markers, if you would, down uh, the center of the church. You will enter from the front, which I call the back, but from the street side of the church, up the steps. Uh, there will be social distancing as you come down here to view, and then you will exit out the side door, my right, your left, as you uh, make your way out of the viewing process. So we will have deacons in place uh, to guide you through that process. Please come with your mask on. Uh, we will have sanitizing procedures once you enter in. But this gives an opportunity for many of you who love Sister Rebane dearly to come and at least view her even though you will not be able to attend the funeral. The funeral will, will be broadcast, though, for those of you that wish to watch. It will be on our regular portals, uh, Facebook, live stream, and YouTube. So you will be able to view it. Uh, you just won't be able to be in the sanctuary. Following that, on Monday, we will also be accommodating the Gomes family. From the hours of 3 in the afternoon to 9 p.m., uh, Mr. Reginald Gomes uh, seems very popular man uh, in society through sports and through other means. And he uh, will have his viewing, not his funeral, but his viewing will be here on Monday from 3 to 9. I believe his funeral will take place some weeks down the road, but his actual viewing will be from 3 to 9 on 
this coming Monday. From 3 to 5 will be for family only. And then from 5 to 9 will be for anyone else that wishes to come in and view the body. Again, the same things will be in place. Wear your mask, come with your protection. We will also have sanitizing sprays and different things as you come in, and you will practice social distancing as well. Uh, for those of you who are a little nervous, especially our seniors, about nervous about coming up the steps uh, at the front of the church, just notice we have a special plan. Just know we have a special plan for those seniors that cannot do that. We will find a way to get you in here where you will not have to come up the steps. And so to the Gomes family, we extend our deepest condolences, and we are happy. We are happy to do what we can to accommodate you during this difficult time of need. Having said that, uh, the premier and his team in the press conference on Thursday has let us know, uh, yeah, Thursday let us know that this coming Thursday, uh, we will enter phase three. Phase three, church, for us, means that we can now allow 96 persons uh, in the building at one time. Now, of course, that still presents to us a massive challenge of which the elders will meet. The elders will meet on Monday at 6.30 to discuss this issue, and then the church board will meet on Thursday at 6.30. Both meetings are by Zoom, and we will meet to discuss how we can handle the logistics of this situation going forward. If you have any suggestions on how we can handle this best, I ask you to refer that either to myself or any one of the other board members, share your ideas, share what you think we could do to make this accommodating for all, and uh, we will have that big discussion, and prayerfully, we know that God will lead us to the right decision uh, as we enter phase three of this pandemic crisis. All right, so we're thankful for all of that. We're thankful for uh, the fact that our country is doing much better. I think last I checked, I think there was just 18 active cases. I think seven of which were uh, in the hospital, I think, and 11 were uh, home, I guess, quarantining or self-watch, whatever it might be. And we are praising God that our country is getting better and better. It's opening up more and more something that is desperately needed for our economy and for the many jobs that are and businesses that are at stake. Having said that, I uh, want to go ahead and recognize that we have two Sabbath birthdays. We don't have any anniversaries today, but we do have two Sabbath birthdays. One is Sister Jacqueline Simons, Sister Jacqueline Simons, and uh, we have Sister Antoinette Dyer. Please give them a call. Uh, give them a call, church family. Tell them how much you love them. Uh, wish them a happy birthday. I think one of them is, is up there in many years. And so just offer them a wonderful happy birthday and love from their family here at the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church. Finally, if you would, in your living rooms, if you would just care to stand with me at this time. I want everybody in your living rooms, please stand. Those of you listening by radio, stand up in front of the radio. And I need you all just to stand up. I need you to turn to your neighbor in your house. If you don't have a neighbor, then turn to the TV. I'll look at the screen so you can look at me, all right? And I need you to look at the screen uh, or look at the neighbor in your house. Uh, and I need you to repeat after me, okay? Can you help me with that? Come on, up on your feet, on your feet. Repeat after me this morning. Say, there's no place. Come on, I can't hear you. There's no place like this place, anywhere near this place. So this must be the place, even though I'm not really in the place. Oh, we are here to bless the Lord today. We're going to sing an amazing song. Shake somebody's hand. Give the person in your house a big old hug. Tell them that you love them. Tell them you're so glad to worship with them this Sabbath as we sing an amazing song, a song that touches our hearts. I want to thank our lady on the screen. I don't have to turn around. It's the Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. Somebody here knows today that when that happens, it's just so easy. It's so easy. It's so easy to love. Let's worship the Lord today in spirit and in truth. Jesus. 
today's health nugget should be about, I didn't have to think hard. The times we are currently living in are full of unease, fear, anxiety, and worry, all ultimately leading to stress. This health nugget on how to reduce your stress can speak to both our younger and older generations. We all have experienced it. Did you know that 77% of people experience stress that affects their physical health? 73% of people have stress that impacts their mental health. With that said, stress can actually lead to hypertension, that's high blood pressure, strokes, heart disease. If you are a stress eater, it can lead to overeating and obesity, depression, and a breakdown ultimately in your immune system, making you more susceptible to colds and illnesses. Today, I wanna to give you three things that you can use to help decrease or manage your stress. Number one is breathing and posture. Have you ever heard the saying, just take a breath, said to you or someone else when you were really anxious or stressed about something? Well, it's probably not bad advice to take. I want you to do a small test for me. Close your eyes. Go ahead, no one's watching. Take a nice, deep, big breath in. Do that three times for me. At the end of the third breath, before you exhale, I want you to pause for a second, open your eyes, and take note of your posture. When you inhale, where does your air go? Is it traveling down into your belly or up into your shoulders? Do you breathe here or here? The way you breathe has a significant impact on your overall health and well-being. Reflect on how your breathing makes you feel. Are you anxious, nervous, relaxed, or calm? Does your rib cage expand forward and backward, side to side? Is your rib cage moving at all? Can you feel your diaphragm descend into your abdomen as you inhale and move upwards as you exhale? Taking time to breathe helps decrease muscle tension, decreases your heart rate, and helps you decrease your anxiety. Posture comes into play, especially when you are in sitting or standing. It is difficult and ineffective to attempt to take a deep breath and get the benefits when you are in a flexed or slouched posture. So be mindful of where your body is in space and make sure you are in a good upright position. Number two, 
Nothing relieves tension and stress in the body like laughing and smiling. Laughter is the physiological response to humor. When we laugh heartily, changes occur in many parts of the body, including the arm, leg, and trunk muscles. There are several benefits of laughter. It relaxes the whole body. A good hearty laugh relieves physical tension and stress, leaving your muscles relaxed for up to 45 minutes after. It boosts the immune system. Laughter decreases stress hormones and increases immune cells. Laughter also increases infection-fighting antibodies, thus improving your resistance to disease. It triggers the release of endorphins. These are your body's natural feel-good chemicals. Endorphins promote an overall sense of well-being and can even temporarily relieve pain. It protects the heart. Laughter improves the function of the blood vessels and increases the blood flow which can help protect you against a heart attack and other cardiovascular problems. Did you know that children on average laugh about 300 times a day compared to adults only laughing 15 times a day? I wonder why they seem less stressed. Number three, now you knew you couldn't get away without me talking about exercise during a health nugget. In Genesis 1 28 and 2 verse 15, we learn to decrease our stress with exercise. It reads, then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. In other words, God gave man his work. Exercise is necessary to the healthy development of the human body. Muscles that are not used will shrink. Bones that do not bear weight will become weak. Exercise gives us strength and vigor. It assists in sleep and digestion and helps to eliminate toxins. It improves your mood, helps manage weight, decreases risk of heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and osteoporosis. And it aids the body in so many other ways. So, how much exercise do you need? Well, the current guidelines suggest that adults need at least two and a half hours of moderate intensity aerobic activity each week and muscle strengthening activities on two or more days of the week that work all your major muscle groups. Moderate intensity aerobic activity means that you could talk to someone else while you were exercising, but you'd be too out of breath to be able to sing. If you could sing or hum a tune while you exercise, that would be considered low intensity. If you could not even talk while exercising, that would be considered high intensity. If you have any concerns about starting an exercise program, you can always go and see your doctor before you begin. Then start slow and work your way up to your goal over the next one to three months. If you can only go from the bedroom to the bathroom and back and forth without getting short of breath, then do that. Then do it again and again and again. Then go from the bedroom to the kitchen and then to the front of the house, and then to the front of the neighbor's house, and then around the block. Just keep increasing your exercise distance little by little as you can handle it, and you will feel the benefits. Anything you do more than you do now will give you benefits. So start exercising today. Most translations of the Bible don't actually use the word stress. They use words like worry, trouble, anxiety, in John 14, verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Matthew 6, 25 says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Proverbs 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Philippians 4, verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I will close out this health nugget with Psalms 55 verse 22. Cast your burdens on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. So, do we all have stress? Yes. Should we allow it to consume us? No. Have a happy Sabbath. Good morning, boys and girls. 
Today's scripture comes from Proverbs 3, verse 5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The Bible gives us many stories that show us how we can trust God. My favorite? David and Goliath. So Nyla and I have recreated the David and Goliath story for you. Let's watch. David was a shepherd boy from Israel. He took care of sheep. One day, a lion came to eat the sheep. Because my sheep. David ran after the lion and used his slingshot to kill the lion. He brought his sheep back home. A long time ago, Saul was king of the Israelites, but he kept disobeying God. So God asked Samuel to find a new king. Samuel went to Jesse's house to meet his sons. He automatically thought that the oldest son would be the future king. But the Lord said to Samuel, I'm not concerned about the way he looks. That doesn't matter to me. I look at the heart. Samuel asked Jesse, Have I met all your sons? And Jesse replied, I have one son left named David. He's the youngest, and he's out looking after the sheep. I will bring him here to meet you. David was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. He was a young shepherd boy who believed in God. One day, a bear came to eat the sheep. He took my sheep! David ran after the bear and used his slingshot to kill the bear. He brought his sheep back home. The Israelites weren't getting along with the Philistines. The Philistines had too many giants living in their land. One of the biggest and strongest giants was a man named Goliath. What did Goliath say, Nyla? David heard Goliath mocking Israel and their God. But David was brave and volunteered to fight Goliath. He persuaded King Saul to let him go fight. King Saul wanted to put his heavy armor and helmet on David. He also tried to give David a big sword. But he said, Oh, I can't wear this. It's too big. He knew that his strength and protection came from God. He said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. You think you fight sword and shoes, but in the name of God. David ran quickly to meet him. He pulled out a stone, put it into his slingshot, and shot it at Goliath. And suddenly, Goliath fell with a loud thud. Yay! Have faith in God like David did, so God can use you in amazing ways too. Only a boy named David, only a little sling. Only a boy named David, but he could pray and sing. Only a boy named David, only a rippling brook. Only a boy named David, five little stones he took. And one little stone went in the sling, and the sling went round and round. One little stone went in the sling, and the sling went round and round. And round and round and round and round and round and round and round. Amen, amen. Well, thank you, Sister Tanea, for that wonderful health nugget, and Nyla for such a wonderful children's story. It is our favorite time of the service. How many of you know that it is a privilege to be able to give to God what belongs to Him? The book of Deuteronomy declares in verse 22 and 23, you shall truly tithe. Oh, the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, of the first one of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. 
the point of tithe is not that God might get rich. It is that you might learn to fear the Lord your God. The privilege is that you get to set your priorities, and it's a clear indication of your heart when you choose to prioritize the works of God before you choose to prioritize your own. Some of you are here today, and obviously you're not in this place, but on our screen, I'm quite certain it's going to come up that shows you how it is that you can give in the various different ways. Maybe not today, but it, it seems to be that that's been up quite most of the weeks. So before we go further, and, and maybe the questions even ask, why do we sing when we collect the tithe? Well, it's a celebration. It's a celebration of what God has done for you. It's a celebration of the promises that God has made to you, knowing full well that God never fails. And so the privilege of being able to give to God again and return unto him that which he's commanded us to give is a privilege. And so we celebrate during this time. So before we start celebrating, let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, you have given unto us, love and God, life, and you've seen to it that we have the sustenance that we needed. There may be some who may not necessarily, who didn't necessarily have that much this week, love and God, and yet they're still here. They're still able to be here, recognize and love and God that you've brought them thus far and that you will continue to take them the rest of their journey. I pray that the funds that come in, love and God, will be used to further your aims and your will throughout the earth, that the gospel might reach every kindred tongue and people throughout all nations, and that their souls might be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. And as we give, we're going to sing a simple song. I just want to praise you forever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. Just want to praise you forever and ever. And ever for all you've done, done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for Just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done, done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to
our scripture reading is found in the last of the Synoptic Gospels, the book of John, in verse 3, starting at verse 14. And it reads, And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have an eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. I pray that you'll think deeply along those words as you consider the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. So we're going to go into our praise and worship this morning. Um, these are well-known songs. Some of you have, are used to singing them at AY or family worship, worship at church. So join along with us. We're going to take it back to buy and buy when the morning comes.
We're singing hallelujah, salvation, and glory. Honor and power. Anybody know he's powerful today? He is wonderful. Join us as we sing this song. Wonderful. 
that he is a good God. He's a merciful God. He's a blessed God. We want to worship him today, spirit of the living God, in the wee hours of this morning. You and I had a conversation about this moment. Speak now for thy servant is listening. All the redeemed of the Lord say amen, say praise the Lord, say hallelujah this morning for what a mighty God uh, we serve. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that for the last several weeks, it has been with a skeletal crew that we have been able to bring to you these services. And we know next week we'll have a little more help at least, but I just want to thank in a special way the many that have served uh, in this building during this time uh, that have given of their best uh, and many have done double and triple duty in God's house during this pandemic. Uh, whether it's our uh, cameraman, uh, our lead media man and elder Kim Aswood, who you never see uh, on the screen, you never see him out front, but he's always working hard behind the scenes. His son, uh, Malachi, has been here faithfully. Uh, Sister Gina Coddington, uh, Sister Annette Eve, uh, uh, Brother Lorenzo Birch, uh, our very own head deacon who has been heading up security and cleanliness and safety and transitions. He's been the prop man. He's been all kinds of stuff. And that our brother Derek Ming. Can't thank him enough for his faithfulness. Uh, I want to thank our musicians, Brother Terry and Janae, for blessing our hearts uh, and coming to help us bring this Brother Kevin Mallory on the camera as well. I don't want to forget anybody. Uh, of course, all of our Sabbath school crew. Uh, and in a special way, uh, coming through uh, during this pandemic, in a marked way, has been none other than the pandemic praise. I call them praise team six. I don't know what we're going to do after this pandemic because the saints seem to love them so much. It's almost like they should have a regular spot. We'll, we, we'll see. We'll see, though. We'll see what happens. Um, I know they have, a couple of them have their own churches, but all of their roots are in Hamilton. And once once a Hamiltonian, always a Hamiltonian. But I can't thank all of you guys enough uh, for coming and us working together to bring to not just the members of Hamilton, but around the world, the opportunity uh, to experience fellowship, uh, to experience the sanctuary experience, uh, to experience Jesus Christ. Uh, even in the midst of this uh, pandemic. I'm so busy talking about uh, uh, this particular thank you. I don't, I don't turn from my main page. I don't know why I'm messing with my pages here. But I want to lift up before you today uh, Jonah chapter 1. I want to lift up before you Jonah chapter, here it is, Jonah chapter 1. And I'm going to begin reading with verse 1. Here's what the word of the Lord says. The Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Verse 3 says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of of the Lord. I lift up before you today this transcendental, this inexorable, this merciful pericope, this merciful pericope running from 
the Lord. Running from the Lord. Church, the truth of the matter is, is that we as a people, as a nation, as a world or community are experiencing times that we never thought we would. We've preached about it. We have talked about it. We have always had that word of prophecy. But I'm not sure too many of us ever thought we would actually experience it. But here we are today in 2020, very fittingly, because we are now seeing prophecy in 2020 vision of the very soon coming and return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. It's interesting, friends, because in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of this growing crisis, in the midst of racial tensions reaching an all-time high, in the midst of the impetus for this, a man lying in the street with a police officer's knee on his neck, the question must be asked, is there a word from the Lord? What does God have to say about all of this? It's interesting because God could come down here and preach the sermon himself. God could come down here and protest himself. God could come down here and he could deliver a timely word that would touch everyone's hearts. But God doesn't operate like that. God uses us to stand up for what he believes. God uses us uh, to actually remind the people about what the mission of Jesus Christ is all about. Turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Jesus says, I have come to relieve the suffering, to relieve the press, the oppressed. I've come to preach good tidings unto the meek. That was my mission when I came to earth. But now that he has gone back, he commissions us as his disciples to go and to stand up for what he stands for. He commissions us to rise up and to say something about the pandemic times we are going through. And now in this particular pericope, we find, we find that, that Jonah is living in some pandemic times. And God has called Jonah to go deliver a word to Nineveh to tell them if they don't get it together, God is going to burn up the entire city. Now it's very interesting because God calls Jonah. He tells him to cry against it. For their wickedness is come up before me. And God calls us today to stand up to cry against the wickedness that's going on in society because the wickedness has come up to him. Oh, understand, uh, it's not just the craziness that's going on with COVID-19. It's, it's just amazing to me how COVID-19 uh, has almost become yesterday's story and now uh, somehow, some way, somehow, some way, racial tensions has become the lead story every day. It, it was very heartwarming. I don't know if everyone saw that yesterday, but it was very heartwarming to see what uh, the, the mayor of D.C. did yesterday. I don't know if you guys saw that, but the mayor of D.C. yesterday painted in huge yellow letters on the entire street next to the White House, Black Lives Matter. And if that wasn't enough, she renamed the street. The street is now called Black Lives Matter 
plaza, I think that's what it is. I think it's a plaza or whatever it is. But the, that section of the street is now called uh, Black Lives Matter. Well, friends, understand, uh, I don't know about down here on earth, but up in glory, black lives have always mattered. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that even uh, uh, those who study biology can affirm to you today that in essence, the first couple, uh, Adam and Eve, had to be a people of color because only people of color can produce all the other colors. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, uh, if it was any other color, they wouldn't be able to produce everybody. But, but because they were a people of color, understand uh, that even when Jesus family had to go on the run because they were trying to kill Jesus. They didn't go and hide in Rome. They didn't go hide anywhere in Europe. They didn't go hide in Finland. They didn't go hide in Italy. No, 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 no. no. When they went to hide out, they went down to Egypt. Oh, Lord, help us. Where they could blend in. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. They went down to Egypt where they could blend in, Jared. They had to blend in. And so, in essence, if they were of another color, if they were of another persuasion, they could have easily been picked up. They could have shown up. The army could have shown up at the gate. Have you seen anybody else of the other color around here? But no, they blended in perfectly. Why? Because whether you look at all the different persons throughout Scripture, even Jesus' ancestors, you find color and more color and more color. And it's only because, it's only because the pages and the history books have been whitened by European oppressors that we remotely think anything else. I grew up. I grew up on White Island, and there was a picture that was posted on my wall uh, of a white Jesus. Uh, that picture was on most of your walls. Don't act like it's just me. It was on most of your walls. Um, it was a picture that was very strange because when you walk past a picture, no matter which direction you looked at it, it looked like it was looking at you. Uh, you thought Jesus was watching your every scene, which he was, but you thought that Jesus on the wall uh, was watching, and you grew up with that image. And the idea of a biblical Jesus who wears locks on his head. The idea of a biblical Jesus being a man of color is uncomfortable for even you when you first realized that. We grew up in a craziness even here in Bermuda understanding that for most of us we grew up hating, uh, if you would, uh, where we came from. Oh, Lord, help us. In other words, many of us grew up here in Bermuda thinking that we all originated in Bermuda. Oh, Lord, help us. That we didn't have no ancestors. Lord, help us. Uh, every, the original Bermudian came right here from Bermudian. Matter of fact, at the Garden of Eden, when they first dispersed, some people came to Bermuda. You know what I'm saying? And the truth of the matter is, is that no, no, no. Majority of the people of color that are in this country are descendants uh, from people from the Caribbean. The very people growing up, you were taught to hate, taught to fight against, taught not to love. Some of you still feel some type of way about people that are from the Caribbean. Oh, Lord, help us. I knew it would even get quiet even in church today. It's quiet in somebody's house. Uh, I, I, but I make no apologies today. The truth of the matter is, some of you still don't like some Caribbean people just because they are Caribbean. It's ingrained in you. <laughs> it's who you are. Huh? Look at me like I'm not saying. I know what I'm saying. It's ingrained in you. <laughs> it's just who you are. But the truth of the matter is, you have amazing love for the oppressors that kept us in bondage for many years. Them are the people that you think are the best people to run the country. They're the best people to run businesses. They're the best people to actually have all the... Understand, uh, you have been taught self-hate uh, from when you were a child. Uh, and now God is calling you to step up in these times uh, and say something uh, about what's going on. Somebody has to tell the story that when we get to heaven, all people are welcomed in glory. And I don't know, but understand, and when we get to glory, there will be no Tucker's town in glory. Oh, 
Lord help us. Everybody in glory gets a mansion made of gold. Everybody walks on streets of gold. Everybody gets to drink from the water of life. Everybody gets a robe of life and a crown of life. Every single person gets to sit at the feet of Jesus. Understand, there is no aristocracy up in heaven. All we have is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, all the rest of us are equal at the foot of the cross. Uh, somebody in here needs to understand today that Jesus is no respecter of persons, uh, that God loves everyone the same. And God is calling us to be Jonas in this day and tell the story that Jesus don't just save, but he saves everybody. It's interesting because when Jonah hears the instructions from the Lord, I got I to gotta stay here because some of you, when you hear this, it's the last thing you want to do is to go and stand up for the oppressed. But when God calls Jonah, he don't want to preach the message either. He don't want to preach it. Jonah rises up when he hears this, right, to go and flee to Tarshish. This is where he runs to. I'm going to Tarshish. I'm going down to Joppa. Huh? This is what the Bible says. He goes, leaves and goes down to Joppa. Understand, every time you're trying to get away from the presence of the Lord, you're always headed in a downward direction. <laughs> I, I, I need you to understand this. Uh, he has to head down uh, to Joppa, right? And he finds uh, a ship going to Tarshish. The Bible says then that he paid uh, the fare. Understand, uh, you cannot run uh, from God's presence without it costing you dearly. Uh, understand, uh, to go away from him, uh, it's going to cost you. Uh, there's something that you're going to have to pay when you run from his presence. Uh, there are some people here today that know that they have suffered greatly because they did not listen to God. They have gone through great things because they refused uh, to acknowledge his word. But he pays the fare they're off and he went, hold on, he didn't just go down to Joppa. Come on now. He paid the fare and then he went down uh, into the boat. <laughs> down to Joppa, then down into the boat to go with them unto Tarshish. Running from the presence of the Lord. It's very interesting, church, because he was supposed to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is just 900 miles in a northerly direction. Jonah gets on a boat that's headed 2,000 miles west. <laughs> Lord help us. Uh, he could have just obeyed God and did it. And we'll get into some of the reasons why he didn't, uh, perhaps as the, this series continues. But Jonah jumps on the boat, gets down into the bottom of the boat to actually run from the presence of God and the call on his life during difficult times. I need you to understand today that God doesn't need Christians right now who run and hide in the bottom of the boat. <laughs> the last thing he needs right now are people that are afraid to proclaim his truth to a world that is struggling. It's interesting because Jonah tries to run from the presence of the living God. This is where Jonah tries to go. He literally tries to run from the presence of the living God. I found a text that I think is very important to our understanding. The Bible says in Psalm 139 some very interesting words. This is after, not long after, David has said, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praises unto thee. This is not long, not long after 
David says, by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. And we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they had carried us away captivity, required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. And they begged the question, the Israelites begged the question in captivity, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Understand one of the growing and difficult things that's even happening in United States society is that instead of the brothers wanting to stand in honor when the anthem is sung, they don't want to sing it because they don't feel like the land they're in is respected to them as as their own. Uh, hence, uh, they don't want to bow down. They don't want uh, to put their arm across their chest. They don't want to stand uh, to honor something that doesn't honor them. They too uh, are begging, how can we sing uh, the Lord's song in a strange land? Uh, but in Psalm 139, uh, this text rebukes Jonah for trying to run away from God. The Bible says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue. But lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all to before I even speak. You know exactly what I'm going to say. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. And then verse 7 says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? It's impossible to flee from the presence of the Lord. So where is Jonah going? He can't go someplace where God is not. Because God is everywhere all the time. He's always going where he just came from. He's always going where he already is. He's always leaving where he just came from. So understand, it's impossible to run from God's presence. Really, scholars say in Hebrew thought, what Jonah is actually doing is not actually trying to get from God's presence, but he's actually trying to get out of the call to preach to the Ninevites. It's very interesting, friends, because the Bible says that Jonah, huh, Jonah gets on the boat. Yes, he does. Jonah gets on the boat. And he goes down into the bottom of the boat. And the Bible says, after they take off, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Right? Then the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man unto his God. Understand, this storm was not caused or sent by the devil. This storm was sent by the Lord. Understand that God sometimes, God will send storms in your life to arrest your attention. Sometimes God will allow things to come your way because you are running or trying to run from his call. There are some that know out there you can't run. I know at the seminary, when I attended there, yes, majority of us were fresh out of uh, Oakwood, fresh out of Andrews, uh, fresh out of Southern, uh, some even coming from AUC. And the truth of the matter is, and we pray for those who came from AUC, Terry, we pray for them continually. But the truth of the matter is, uh, is, that, is that in essence, and primarily because it's, it's a place that's not worth mentioning anymore, it just... It just doesn't exist. You know what I'm saying? But the truth of the matter is, uh, is, that, is, that, is that these guys mostly, probably 90% of us were straight out of college. 
or were pastoring for a while and then came to the seminary. But at least five, maybe 10% were men who had run from the call of God. I mean, you're in there and you're in a class with a guy that's 55, 60 years old, who's in the seminary right now, who's been a medical doctor all his life, all of his life. He's rich. He's got tons of, why are you here, man? Man, God told me to be a preacher when I was 20. I just got sick and tired of running, so now I'm here. <laughs> you got guys that have been in the finance world, walking into the seminary, 45 years old, got grown adult kids, grandkids on the way, walking in, talking about, why are you here, man? Well, I was in finance, I was doing great, but I was never happy. I was never satisfied because I didn't answer the call of God. And you ought to understand, church, that until you do what God has called you to do, you will not be happy in your life. <laughs> You will constantly feel short. You will constantly feel inadequate. You will constantly feel like you're missing the mark. And you will not be able to rest. Understand uh, that the reason why Jonah runs down into the bottom of the boat is because Jonah is stressed out of his mind. Uh, and he's hoping... Uh, that somehow he can sleep his stress away. <laughs> He's hoping that if I go down here and I rest, not only will I get some peace of mind, but on top of that, I will be able to actually sleep through the call of God <laughs> so that when I get up and get from this trip, it will be too late for Nineveh. Nineveh will already be destroyed and I won't have to preach that message. But understand, uh, God can find you out on the ocean, on a cruise boat, sleep in the bottom of the boat. God can find you anywhere. He always knows where you are. The Bible says, then the mariners were afraid. To be more clear, mariners in Scripture, and even to some extent today, were simply the navigators. So the people who are supposed to be telling them, turn left and turn right, are scared out of their minds. Because the water is beating into the boat so much that in essence it feels like the water is going to break. Now, you know, uh, some of you may know, I often like standing over here by the organ. Because at the organ, I can look through the window and I can see White's Island where I grew up. So I love standing over here by the organ. Uh, people, say, well, people think I like the organ. That organ needs repairs. I don't like that organ that much. Understand uh, that in essence, I like looking through the window to see White Island. But I'm telling you right now that, that for us, going home or, 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 or not going home, Brother Me, was not an option. There was no such thing as, as, as coming home after school and saying, well, it's too rough today or it's too choppy today. We're not going home. And we never had no big, massive boat. If we had to go home, we were going home. If the water was extremely rough, get your boots on. They were always in the car. Get your rain suit on, your boots on. Tighten it up tight. We're going home. Now, it's very interesting because anybody that has ridden in severe storms, you know wind is blowing, rain is coming down so hard you can barely see in front of you. And on top of that, you are trying to ride these big waves uh, that are coming. And if you don't ride them properly, the water can come over the boat. Now, it's interesting, friends, because when this storm comes, uh, they realize in their minds that usually when water's coming over the top of the boat, that means that the boat is not light enough. So they start throwing everything off the boat, <laughs> all the articles, Huh? All the pieces of furniture, all of the suitcases, all the belongings, they're just tossing it. Why? Because, understand, as they climb the big wave, the wave is coming over before they can get over the top. Uh, they're not getting to the top fast enough, and the waves are swallowing them up. They don't realize uh, that the real weight that they have on the boat uh, is a disobedient servant of the Lord uh, that's waiting 
weighing the whole boat down. Uh, you can throw off all kinds of stuff. You can try your best to fix your conscience in many different ways when God has called you to do something. But until you do what he asks you to do, uh, your conscience will never be right. It's amazing because when I look at this particular pericope, it's amazing because Jonah thinks he can run from God and in the process of running from God, all he does is cause pain, suffering, and destruction to everyone that's around him. Be careful of someone that God has asked to do something that's running from the call. God will shake up their surroundings to get their attention so that they can do what he asked them to do. It's amazing because the mariners don't know what to do. And Jonah hmm, is asleep. Jonah was going down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. The last thing we need right now in Earth's history is fast asleep Christians uh, who don't understand the message, uh, who don't understand we are a peculiar people with a peculiar message, that we've been called uh, to dress a peculiar way, uh, that somehow they don't seem to grasp it. I got a praise team member that I won't call by name, uh, but she understands the concept of a less decorative approach. Uh, she understands uh, that if you're going to stand before God, uh, you've got to put off some things. Uh, some things have got to get thrown in the ocean uh, when you are serving the Lord. Uh, it's interesting because as we look at this story, God is looking for someone to stand for him uh, and the people, the people of God today, many are afraid to stand uh, because of consequences. There are people in Bermuda that are afraid to stand against injustice because it may affect my job. Uh, I might lose my job. I might miss out on a promotion. I got to keep my mouth shut. The white man still owns everything. Uh, he's still in control. No, 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 no. Understand uh, that you serve God first. Uh, he owns everything. Uh, he owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. Uh, everything that is here belongs to him, including every human here. He puts breath in their bodies and he can remove it anytime he wants. Your challenge is to serve God without reservation. It's amazing. Because right now, Jonah is down in the boat, and he's fast asleep. He thinks he's escaped God's presence. So the shipmaster, the shipmaster is searching because he's looking for more things to throw overboard. And he comes down to the bottom of the boat, and there is Jonah. The Bible says, what meanest thou? Oh, sleeper, this is, this, 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 this is the shipmaster talking to Jonah. In other words, in other words, how in the world are you asleep during a time like this? How is it that you have nothing to say with the rest of us during a time? How is it that you're not helping to bail out the boat in a time like this? How is it? The rest of us are up there oaring uh, and trying to row the boat to shore uh, and you uh, are asleep in the boat. It's amazing. Arise, he says, call uh, upon thy God. Now understand in verse 5, everyone called on their God and he didn't answer because the God that they serve, the many gods that they are following, have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. They have hands, but they handle not. Come on, they have noses, but they smell not. And, and, and the Bible says, those that make them are like unto them. Understand, they're calling upon all these different gods to deliver them. Understand, even today, you can call on a bunch of different gods. You can call on Confucius, and he can't hear you. You can call on Muhammad, he can't hear you either. You can call on all the dead popes up in glory. Understand, you realize real quick they ain't up in glory. They're down inside of their graves. You can call even right now. You can shout out to the pope right now, the pope that's alive. You can go outside your house right now and holler, Pope, help me. Come through for me. And guess what? He can't hear you ever. He can never hear what you got to say way over there in Rome. But we serve a living God that when you call on his name, 
Bathsheba, he hears you wherever you are. It doesn't matter if you are up in a plane, he can hear you. If you are down in the depths of the ocean, he can hear you too. The God we serve can hear our cry and he knows exactly where we are. What meanest thou, O sleeper, says the shipmaster, how can you be sleep at a time like this? Call on your God. If so, be that God will think upon us. Think upon us that we perish not. I think it's very important to realize sometimes we think God just sets the world into motion and just lets it run. This text lets us know very clearly that God pays attention to everything. <laughs> that even in the midst of this situation, he's paying attention. And they said, every one of his fellow, come and let us cast lots. Guys are throwing dice on the, on, on, on the boat. Right? Come and cast lots that we may know for those cause, for whose cause this evil is upon us. Now, it's amazing how God uses an evil, God uses an evil tactic to identify the culprit. The joker's up there, you know, using gambling tactics to find out who is the culprit. And right when they, right when they cast lots, it falls right at Jonah. Huh? They said unto him, and it's amazing, they believe in their lot casting. <laughs> when, they, when, they, when they point to, hey, hey, tell us, man. Tell us what's going on here, man. We pray thee. For whose cause this evil is upon us? Because we have rode and we haven't moved an inch. The wind has been directly contrary to us. Understand, when they went to the north, the wind went against them. When they went to the south, the wind, when they went to the east, and when they went to the west, every direction they tried to go, they could not move an inch. Tell us what's going on. They started asking them questions. What is your occupation? Huh? What is your job, sir? You know what I'm saying? Because clearly the lot fell on you. What is your occupation? What is your job, man? Tell us. Where are you coming from? Huh? They're trying to figure out what the problem is. <laughs> What's your job? Where did you come from? What's your country, man? What is your country of birth? Where is your uh, uh, place of birth? We need show us um, your birth certificate. We need to know where you from, where you were born, uh, what's your job, uh, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them in verse 9, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which have made the sea and the dry land. And when the men heard this, they were exceedingly afraid because they knew the God he served was greater than the gods they had prayed to. They know their gods had never did anything for them, but this so-called God of heaven that the Hebrews serve has done some amazing things. He's parted Red Seas. He's parted the Jordan River. He has caused ten plagues to wipe out the whole nation of Egypt. He killed even all the firstborn in the land. They know that this God is an amazing God. He tore down the walls of Jericho with simply a shout of the people. They understand in this moment uh, that they are messing with the real deal. They're trembling. The Bible says they come to him, they said, for the man knew that he had run in from the presence of God. Because Jonah told him, look man, I'm running from him. That's what's going on. All this destruction around you because I'm trying to run from God. The knucklehead won't leave me alone. He keeps chasing me. <laughs> Day and night, he's chasing me. Hmm. David says, not just the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> I shall not want. <laughs> he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still one. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for my name. For his name said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. And then he goes to verse 6. And he says, surely, <laughs> Lord help us. He says, surely, come on, come on, surely, surely what? Huh? Your goodness and your mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know what it reminds me of, Jack? You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of this. Whenever, when we was playing for teams uh, as teenagers here in Bermuda, uh, playing on football teams in, uh, at Bermuda Institute, the greatest school uh, in Bermuda, 
uh, uh, Bermuda Institute of Seventh-day Adventists. Register your kids, uh, send them there. It's the greatest school uh, in Bermuda. I'll say, I know I got some teachers that teach at other schools, but you're not at the mic right now. I am. <laughs> Understand, uh, it's the greatest school. Uh, it's the greatest school in Bermuda. But I, I, I need you to understand, we will play football, and, and later on, I'd play for North Village. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that one of the things that some of us did, not all, but certain guys, when we would score a goal, when we would score a goal, instead of going to celebrate with the team, we would take off running from the team. Huh? Some of you have seen this even now in live soccer. That in essence, you score a goal, you take off running away from them, and immediately when you start running, they start chasing. Huh? They chase you all around the field until they catch you, and then there's a big celebration pile. Huh? I need you to understand today huh, that when uh, you decide uh, to run from God, huh, there's the Lord, huh, there's the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, huh, and an entourage of angels that get to chasing you every single place you go. Why? Because goodness huh, and mercy huh, shall follow thee all the days of thy life. Huh? They will chase you and chase you and chase you till you surrender uh, and give in uh, and give God your whole heart. Understand uh, that some of you are running but you can't outrun God. Uh, some of you are running but you can't get away from his presence. Uh, wherever you go he is. Uh, he's always there and he's always present. They said unto him verse 11 what shall we do unto thee then? Being you caused all this mess what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm unto us? We know that your Lord parted the Red Sea. Moses just struck out his hand and it opened. Stuck it out again, stuck the rod out again, and it closed back up. So talk to us, for the sea is roared, and it was tempestuous. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, in other words, the men ignored him. The men rode hard to bring it to the land. But they could not, for the sea roared, and the tempestuous, and was tempestuous against them. Verse 14, wherefore they cried unto the Lord. Hold on now. Understand, God always takes your foolishness and turns it for good. Earlier on in the text, they were calling on their gods. They were calling on all their heathen gods, all their gods that they served with idols. Understand, earlier in the text, they were focused on their own god. But in the end of this text, they understand who's the real king of kings and lord of lords. And they don't call on their gods. They call on the God of heaven. Oh, Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. Don't let us die because of his nonsense. And let, hold on now. Don't let us die because of his foolishness. But secondly, please don't make us pay for what we're about to do. Oh, Lord, help us. Don't, 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 don't hold it against us. You know what I'm saying? Don't make us suffer and be punished because of his disobedience. But at the same time, it's he that told us to throw him overboard. And so because we believe that he serves you and because we believe that his word came from you is the only reason we dare remotely try to offend you by throwing him over. And so it's understanding, you know, uh, uh, it's an amazing thing because sometimes, um, you know, you feel bad for little creatures and stuff uh, before they die. You know, sometimes, sometimes uh, you may see a roach or you may see a little mouse or something or you may see some sort of creature that you want to take out. Sometimes you feel a little bad about it before you step on it. You realize it could be somebody's mama, somebody's child, you know what I'm saying? But, but, but you, just, you just whisper up a little brief prayer. Uh, somebody says, some people are shaking their heads. Church, they're saying they've never felt this remorse. I, I don't know. They have hardness of heart. I don't know what it is. But understand, uh, understand that you should at least say a little prayer before you put the bag on them. Come on now, a little something. Lord, forgive them uh, and forgive me. <laughs> I do know what I'm doing, but forgive me. Understand, understand that in essence, in essence, they offer up a prayer and say, look, we're throwing him over. Most likely, 
he's going to die because I can't see him surviving this storm. Most likely he's going to die. Please don't hold this man's innocent blood against us. O oh Lord, thou hast done as it pleased thee. So then they took up Jonah, threw him forth into the sea. And the Bible says, and the sea ceased from her raging. Oh, as soon as Jonah hit the water, when they threw him, <laughs> the tempestuous waves uh, were, were ripping and touring and, and doing all kind of craziness. But between the throw <laughs> and the splash, <laughs> the sea turned calm. <laughs> oh, I need somebody to understand that, that, that God <laughs> is looking for people that are willing to stand. And you're going to have to go through some of the most tempestuous times you've ever seen. But there's a little distance between when they call for the death decree and the voice from God is heard. Uh, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Understand that you will have to go to the brink, but deliverance is right around the corner. Just hold on and be faithful, and God will see us through. And guess this out. Check this out. As soon as they see that it went calm, the men on the boat got even more afraid. They got so afraid. Hold on. These are heathen men worshiping heathen gods, but they got so afraid, church, that they offered a sacrifice on the boat to the living God. Oh, come on, man. Jokers, jokers didn't know how to hold the service. They didn't know the liturgy. They didn't know when to say the opening prayer or the closing prayer. They mixed up the opening hymn. They messed that up with the, with, the, with, the, with the actual special music at the beginning of the service. They got all kinds of things wrong at the start of the service. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know how to sacrifice the animal properly. I don't even know how they found an animal on the boat. Somehow, perhaps there was one sleeping right behind Jonah at the bottom of the boat. Because God always has a ram in the thicket. And I need you to understand that somehow uh, they were able to offer a sacrifice to the living God on the boat. Uh, these heathen men uh, realized who the God of heaven was. Uh, and if he could do all of this, uh, then surely he could save me. I need somebody here to understand today that there is no place uh, that God cannot find you. There is no place he won't come looking for you. And wherever you are, he promises to deliver. So stop running from the Lord. Stop running from him. Because, as the song says, Brother Henry, to the utmost, Jesus saves. Come on, man. To the utmost, Jesus saves. As the praise team comes on up onto the platform, perhaps there are some of you out there that have been running from the Lord. And you're tired of running. Because if you've been running, it's been nothing but confusion, and turmoil all around you. But today you want to say to Jesus, I surrender all. I give myself to you so that you can use me today. I invite you just to stand wherever you are, in your homes, by radio, stand up, look at the radio. Stand up, look at the TV, look at the iPad, look at the computer, whatever it is. Stand up, take a look at it. Tell Jesus today, all to thee, I surrender. Whatever you call me to do, whatever you call me to say, whatever you call me to preach, that is what I will do in this day and hour. God bless all of you. May his peace be with you. Let me pray with you before you take your seat. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you. And even when we run from you, you come running after us. Thank you for never giving up on us. As messed up and as broken as we are, you keep on. You keep on. You keep on chasing after us. Some have fallen three times. Some have fallen 50 times. Some have fallen a thousand times. 
but your grace and your mercy keeps on chasing us. Thank you for your love. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Closing hymn this afternoon, When We All Get to Heaven, hymn number 633. Father, we want to thank you for your word today. We have been challenged to stop running from you, Lord, and that we should run towards you, that we might fulfill the purpose that you have created us for. Father, there are many out there even today who needed this word today, Father, and so we're so thankful that you were able to use your manservant to speak to our hearts today. As we leave this place, Father, help us to remember that you are always there, that you have never left us and you will never leave us. That is your solemn promise. And so keep us, loving God, as we leave this place. May your spirit continue to move through this country. May you continue to be the comforter and the wisdom that we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
What a 